We'd like to thank everybody for being here. We have a bunch of high school kids that are still going to be on their way. So grab some food, coffee, something to drink. Enjoy talking to each other. And we'll start a little bit later than they get that would elevate me to new heights. So, uh, can you get around now by yourself? 
I told Paula, but let me remind her again. Yes. <laughs> You know, 
Good morning, everybody. If we can get you to work your way inside, that would be fantastic. We'll give you a couple of breaks so we can go get t-shirts and more food. We've got an incredible lunch coming. So, my name is Paul Adal. I am the women's basketball coach here at Bishop College. Thank you. I'm also a professor of kinesiology, and I am the women's Let's see, Women's Athletic Faculty Director. And this is just, you know, sometimes we have a dream, and then that dream comes to pass. You know, when I'm laying in bed, I think, what could I really love to have happen? And I think, if I could get Nikki Blue and Cheryl Miller to come talk to the women and high school players in Bakersfield, that would be a great accomplishment. And because of San, um, Sonia Christian, and um, who liked my idea and ran with it, and then Trina, Trina, yeah, don't run away. You need to wave your hand. Yes. Trina Perry back here in the green box. I mean, I'm emailing her at midnight, and she's responding at 2 o'clock in the morning. And um, it wouldn't happen. And we've got Stephanie Baker in the booth, who's done so much. <laughs> Earl, who's tried to script us and take pictures. We have Cheryl Scott with the foundation. We have so many people, and I know that I've missed some, but so many people who have been behind the scenes who have worked so hard to make this happen, and I just can't say thank you enough. And then, my mentor, the one that uh, preceded me here at Bakersfield College, someone I'm very grateful to call friend, um, who is our softball coach, associate athletic director, office mate, and just woman of integrity that I appreciate so much, Sandy Taylor. Um, you know, I ended up my career as the director of athletics here, and I can't tell you how much Title IX has done for me and the amount of time we have today because it's just overwhelming. But I would not have ever dreamed that I could have finished as a director of athletics over one of the largest athletic departments in the state of California. It's an amazing department, and to think that I was involved with it as a coach and then all the way through to the director of athletics is amazing. Um, I was able to start playing athletics at a younger age thanks to Title IX. As a kid growing up, I didn't have any athletics. They started a couple of teams while I was in high school and then another team and another team. By my senior year, I actually had three sports that I could play. Volleyball, basketball, and softball. And then I went to College of Sequoias, was able to play all three. And they were in their second year of existence, and you would have had no idea, by the way the department ran that program, that it was so new. Then I was lucky to go to Fresno State and play softball on a scholarship up there, and at that time, it was AIAW, which is a different organization than the NC2A. And then the NC2A comes in and takes over all the championships, and I played in the first College World Series in Omaha, Nebraska at a city park for a national championship on ESPN. And I'm a little country kid that has never even dreamed of playing. So it is an amazing time to celebrate 50 years. You know, Sammy, that couldn't be truer. So I was raised in a home with four older brothers, and they taught me real quick how to defend myself and to compete. I was not a pretty, pretty princess. It was game on. I remember my brother Greg one day, we're in the backyard, he's 10 years older than I am, I'm probably about 13. 
And we're playing one-on-one. -on -one. And he's being kind to me. And I go, if you can't bring your all, I'm not interested in playing. <laughs> and that is the house that I grew up in. But had I been the oldest in that family instead of the youngest, I wouldn't have played basketball. Because where I lived, basketball wouldn't have been an option. And as a result of not playing basketball, I wouldn't have had a full ride, call, full ride basketball scholarship to play at NAU. And as a result of that, I would not be here as the head women's basketball coach just finishing my 29th year at Bakersfield College. So for many of you young women, we are so glad you're here so that you can learn a little bit about the history and about where you came from, and some of these incredible women that are trailblazers to make this happen. Many of you don't know, which is really sad to me, but you're gonna to get to know her, the name of Cheryl Miller. Now, you guys have heard the term goat before? Cheryl Miller is the goat. <laughs> And it has been so fun for me today to introduce people to Cheryl and also another goat, in my opinion, her buddy um, and my buddy, Alicia Berger, and introduce them. And you can just see everybody just like, <laughs> and then the stories. And the stories when we have so many Hall of Famers today, UCLA Hall of Fame. Two UCLA Hall of Famers, the USC Hall of Famer, Women's Basketball Hall of Famer, Basketball Hall of Famer, and this is just exciting. It is. I think we should move along. Yeah. We're, uh, thanks for everybody filling in. And you know, the thing is, is that even in the panels when we were doing the prep for this, you could just talk all day and more days because of all of our experiences. So we hope that you get a, a little bit of all of that history, but also the celebration of where we come to, which brings me to introduce our next speaker to, to welcome you, Dr. Sonia Christian, who is a tremendous leader. She has broken the mold as it comes to leadership. She has been, you talk about a mentor, but she's a friend, somebody I know I could go to for anything anytime, anywhere, and she would be there, and she would, how can we make this happen? And I would like to introduce you to the next state chancellor, Dr. Sonia Christian. <laughs> from Riverside, please stand up. Yay. Our coach from Riverside. There we go. Right outside. Good morning, Kern Community College District. We have a group out in Saracoso watching us and at Portable College as well. At the Kern Community College District, we dare mighty things. When I say we, you say dare mighty things. And that's exactly what happened 50 years ago with the Title IX legislation and Patsy Mink, and you're gonna be hearing about that later. But for now, I just wanna celebrate our local women. If it wasn't for Coach Paula Dahl, we wouldn't be here today. And you see, when I was president of BC, I would see Coach Dahl all the time because Sandy and I would go to all of the games. We would be hanging out cheering Coach Dahl and our student athletes, and then I became chancellor, and I didn't go to as many games as I wanted to. Then Paula and I would meet up when Sandy was getting an award, and she constantly kept getting an award, didn't she? So we were down south, and Sandy was being inducted into a Hall of Fame. And so that's when uh, Coach Dahl was saying, we've got to do something about Title IX. We've got to make sure we get those videos so our students can see it and continue the story about Title IX. So all of the students from the current high school district, student athletes, please stand up. Let's recognize them. Please stand up, students. Stan Green. 
Ken Green, where are you? Stan Green, right over there, okay? Want to thank Stan Green because he came in with boatloads of funding to make this conference happen. Thank you, Stan Green. So there were three women who pulled together the programming for today's event. Paula Dahl, Sandy Taylor, and Michelle miller Gillas. Come on over here, our dean from Portable College. Michelle is the president of the American Association of University Women and DKG, and she's got a few words for you. Thank you all very much for coming and all of the high school students that are here. Today we're celebrating the past and we're looking at what brought us here. And I hope that you listen and that you understand that there's still much more work to do. So all the high school students, we're kind of passing the torch on to you to make sure that uh, the rights of Title IX continue and that you are in the community and that you're learning and that you're advocates for this wonderful legislation and all rights for women, women athletes, education, everything. So the title of the conference celebrating Title IX, a focus on athletics and education. And you know, I'm really proud of the current community college district. When you look at our three colleges and you start from the leadership of our vice presidents, at Portland College, two of the three vice presidents are women. At Bakersfield College, two of the three vice presidents are women. And at Saracosa, one of the three. And then when you look at the uh, presidents and the chancellor, we have two out of the four, you know, three president and chancellor are women. And at one time, when I was president at BC, we had Rosa Carlson at Portable and Jill Ward at Saracosa, and our chancellor, Sandra Solano, woman. So we had four out of four, 100%. So uh, then when you move on to our board of trustees, we have three of our seven board members are women. And I don't know if Nan Gomez Heitzberg has come, but when she comes, we'll make sure we recognize Nan. And uh, on the Board of Governors for the California Community Colleges, we have Pauline Larwood from the current board was on the statewide board. Uh, Nan Gomez Heitzberg is on the board for the California Community College Trustees. She's also on the National Board of Trustees. So we in Kern have been recognizing the leadership, women in leadership, for many, many years. In fact, the first president of Bakersfield College was a woman. So we've just historically been very, very committed uh, to women in leadership. My message to all of our young women here today is to make sure that you are warriors for opportunities for everyone. Just like Patsy Mink, who wrote the legislation, you're going to be hearing uh, about her book, Fierce and Fearless, and the two authors, a daughter, Gwendolyn Mink, and a faculty from Irvine, uh, University of California at Irvine, Judy Wu, who is here with us today. So my ask of you is to always be warriors so that you make sure that there is no opportunity denied to anyone. Everyone deserves an opportunity. So it was, you know, Title IX was opportunity for women, but we've got to be constantly vigilant. In fact, when you look at women in leadership and women in certain disciplines in education like STEM, we still have a ways to go to achieve parity. But when you look at our incoming college-going population, what we are noticing, actually, is that there is a decline in our young men participating in college. So now, you know, we, we, don't, we always want to make sure that the curriculum is just right. And we're being always vigilant about opportunity for all. With that, welcome everyone to the best community college district in the nation. Um, I, I'm pleased to bring up 
our softball coach, who is also a Hall of Famer, and uh, Casey Goodman, and uh, she's gonna introduce, she's gonna take part in you should be blue. You see? by telling you guys, I am not good at speaking in front of people. I would much rather be on a field coaching. I, I seem just walking. Hi. Um, I'd much rather be on a field coaching, but I am very um, honored and excited that Dr. Christian, uh, Paula Donald, and Sandy uh, thought that I would be worthy enough to, to um, introduce our, our guest and sit and have a great conversation with her. So with, with that being said, Nikki Blue. I'm going to make her come up here while I read her bio. Coach Nikki Blue was born and raised in Bakersfield, California, off 4th and P Street, to be specific. She graduated from West High School, where she was a four-time, excuse me, four-time first-team All-Area Player of the Year and set the CIF Central Selection single season scoring record of 913 points in one season. She totaled 2,934 points for her career at West High School. She is regarded as the best female basketball player to ever come out of the CIF Central Selection. She was also named a McDonald's All-American in its inaugural year for females. She participated in the 2002 WCA High School All-American game in which the top high school girls basketball players compete. These accomplishments presented Nikki with an offer for a full athletic scholarship excuse me, to play collegiate basketball for the University of California, Los Angeles. <laughs> there, her athletic superiority continued. She was voted to the all-freshman team her first year. She was a four-year starting point guard and earned first team all-Pac-10 conference honors for four years consecutive. During her freshman year, she averaged 16.6 points, 5.5 rebounds, 3.6 assists, and 2.7 steals per game. That's in the Pac-10 as a freshman. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> as a sophomore, she was named first team all Pac-10 for the second straight year. As a junior, she joined Ann Myers as the second Bruin to record over 1,300 points and 400 assists. Nikki Blue graduated from UCLA in 2006 with a Bachelor's of Arts degree in History. After her dominant college career, she was selected 19th overall in the 2006 WNBA draft by the Washington Mystics. She played four seasons with the Mystics and one season for the New York Liberty in 2010. She's also competed professionally overseas, having played basketball in Turkey in 2007 and in Greece in 2008. In 2008, Nikki Blue accepted a coaching position at UNLV, where she spent six seasons as the top assistant women's basketball coach for head coach Kathy Oliver, in 2014, she returned back to her hometown of Bakersfield to continue her coaching career at CSUB as the Roadrunner's top assistant coach. After three years at CSUB, she transitioned her coaching career to Grand Canyon University for two, two seasons before returning to the Pac-12 as the offensive coordinator and assistant coach for Arizona State. After successful 14 years as an assistant coach at the collegiate level, Nikki advanced her coaching career to the next level by returning to the WNBA as an assistant coach of the Phoenix Mercury. She is currently in her second season as the top assistant coach for the Phoenix Mercury. Nikki Blue has been celebrated and decorated in the sport of basketball, but, is, but it is her involvement in the Bakersfield community that, is she, that she is most proud of. Nikki is a proud product of the <clears throat> excuse me, of west side of Bakersfield, has given back to the Bakersfield and Kern County community throughout the years by hosting free basketball camps and clinics for the youth. She's partnered with Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation in hopes of promoting the importance of exercise and diabetes awareness. She's also been an ambassador of the Down Syndrome Buddy Walk to promote awareness, acceptance, and the inclusion of people with Down Syndrome. She's also volunteered her time at local recreational facilities for low-income families, the Friendship House, as well as other local organizations. Nikki has one daughter, Callie Marie Coleman, and she currently helps raise three of her cousins with her Aunt Bertha, Jai, Kai, and Kalani. She is the daughter of his great honor. Ladies and gentlemen, Nikki Blue. Coach, 
How's it going? Good. Okay, so you said speaking in front of people is tough for you, but you can talk in front of your players. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> speaking in front of people is tough for me, believe it or not, too. So let's see how this conversation goes. We're going to roll with it. Yeah, I think we'll be okay. It's cringeworthy of this standing up here, you know, listening this to myself. Right? Yeah. And you said that uh, 14 years as an assistant coach, I feel super old. <laughs> What she thinks is I'm older than so I appreciate that. Well, okay. Bakersfield, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. So we're, we're going unscripted here, so we're just kind of flowing to things. And to start it off, um, just a little background. Nikki and I haven't seen each other in over 20 years. Uh, so today is the first day that we've seen each other since her freshman year in high school, my senior year of high school. So I don't, I'm not going to say what years, but that ages us quite a bit. Yeah. So Nikki, we kind of talked before um, this started, and we talked about the, the great uh, competitions that we used to have in high school with North Girls Basketball and West Girls Basketball. And I kind of alluded to the fact that you came out of nowhere. So can you tell us about your journey and how it started? Yes, uh, we did have some epic battles. It was crazy, West against North. Um, and uh, a lot of people thought when I got to the high, uh, the high school level, I, and I started to get noticed um, that I did come out of nowhere. Uh, but in fact, I came from somewhere. Uh, I came from uh, Fourth and P. Uh, so anyone knows where the streets start meeting, where the numbers start meeting the letters, it gets a little sketchy, so they say. Uh, but that's all for me. You know, it's, I guess, technically the hood. I went to Emerson Junior High School, and, uh, whoa, whoa, Eagles. <laughs> went to Emerson Junior High School, and uh, what was crazy is that, what I was telling you, Casey, is that uh, we actually played outdoors. Uh, we didn't have a gym. I was from the inner city, and uh, on a day like this, we would play. It was, we had a game against, you know, Washington, or a game against, um, I don't know, whoever else was in our league, we would go outside and, and, and play, so we didn't have the luxury of playing inside of a gym. Um, but we loved the sport of basketball and, you know, made it work. So after uh, junior high, went to West, um, did a couple good things there. Um, <laughs> it was, it was a, a fun time, so had a successful four years uh, at West High School. Um, actually was invited to the McDonald's All-American game, uh, the very first inaugural women's basketball, uh, women's McDonald's All-American game. <laughs> so I, that really makes me feel old, because it's like, you were the first in the game. Like, that's crazy, and now it's been around. But um, so after the McDonald's All-American game, was afforded a scholarship at uh, UCLA, the number one public university in America. Did you catch that, Coach Miller? <laughs> <laughs> Number one public university in America. And you did some pretty impressive things at UCLA. So what was it at UCLA that, that kind of elevated your game, not, not necessarily just as a, a, a basketball player, but a female basketball player? What opportunities did UCLA afford you as a, as a female basketball player? So just be, be given the opportunity to go to college and play uh, as a female you know, for a major university like that, um, to put it in perspective, our valedictorian of my uh, high school, my senior year, did not even get into UCLA, but I did. So just to get, be able to have that opportunity to get my education, and you know, from the number one public university in, in America is, is you know, amazing, and that's because of basketball and opportunity. And um, to kind of appreciate that a little bit more, you kind of got to go back to my roots from Fort and me. My uncle was a all-star a basketball player, the late Carl Tony, and he um, went on to play at uh, Cal State Bakersfield and also played overseas and also had a deal with the, the Clippers before he got injured. Uh, so after college, he had the opportunity to go play basketball further. So my mother, which came, I believe, about 15 years after him, which everyone in Bakersfield says my mother was actually better than me which is crazy, right? So just, just think about this whole time of mind thing. They say she was better than me. Um, so a quick fact, Cheryl Miller, Coach Miller, when you were uh, the player of the year down in Southern California, my mom was player of the year in Central, same year. So my mom was a bad one. <laughs> she was good. 
But again, as I put it into perspective, after high school, my mom got the opportunity to uh, go to a junior college, really didn't have the opportunity to go to a major university, and there was no WNBA at the time, limited spots, there were limited spots overseas, like no one from my neighborhood knew about going to play overseas. So that was kind of the end of her basketball career. So if you think of, you know, fast forward, and me being in the same situation as her, being that good in basketball, the opportunities that she would have had if there would have been a professional league or if there would have been more opportunities for ladies like her to come out, like how different our lives would have been. Um, we still lived a great life, but things would have been a little bit different uh, in, that, in that respect. And so keeping going with your journey there, you, you graduate with your degree, which is very important, you athletes that are in here, getting that degree, okay? Um, but, you know, a great basketball player getting a degree from UCLA and then transitioning into the pro game and then transitioning into coaching. Um, you're with the Phoenix Mercury now. So what challenges as a, as a female coach have you come up against um, that maybe others don't at, at the professional level and college level? Yeah, um, I mean, at both levels, we still face challenges today, even 50 years after, you know, um, the implementation of Title IX. Uh, equal pay is a big one, right? The equality of pay. Um, we are on the same level, or even playing field as, you know, the Phoenix Suns. We actually share a building, which is kind of nice. Uh, but there is a discrepancy in the pay. Coaches, players, everything. So um, even though we are the same athletes, we train the same way, we spend the, the same amount of time, uh, we aren't compensated uh, the same. Um, but, you know, we don't cry about things like that, do you? No. What do you do? You go out and you make a change. And you talk about it and you speak about it. <laughs> and you, you, you change the, uh, you know, the, your, your perspective. You change the, the climate of it by, you know, just continuing to speak about it. And I think that's important, uh, an important thing for the young athletes in here to know is that um, as women, we don't just sit and accept it. You know, we, we break through those ceilings as, as professionals, as coaches, and, you know, coaching professionals is, is probably a lot different than coaching, you know, at the high school level and the college level. But how, how do you, how do you implement those, those strengths to the athletes and, and not let them use that as a crutch or, or an excuse? Yeah, so um, just a quick, a quick story. When I was younger, when I was younger, um, there was this commercial on TV, and it was Pizza Hut back in the day, and they had just introduced stuffed crust pizza. You guys, I know it's not nothing for you guys, but like for us, it was stuffed crust pizza. And I said, Mama, I gotta have that stuffed crust pizza. And so I'm like, we have to order it. Right? So, again, being from Fourth and P, we called up Pizza Hut and tried to order a stuffed crust pizza. Once we gave them our address, they said, uh, we don't deliver in that neighborhood. Real, real story. We don't deliver in that neighborhood. And we were like, okay, well, why? Well, that's the bad part of town, right? So, called up Domino's. Do you guys have a stuffed crust pizza? Well, what's your address? We don't deliver in that neighborhood, right? No pizza place would deliver in our neighborhood. That's how, I guess, bad. We didn't think it was bad. We were fine. <laughs> they said it was. Only Rusty's Pizza. Shout out to Rusty's Pizza. <laughs> with, with the pizza in the wedges, right? You know, so, um, you know, it's the same situation. Uh, well, what did, we, what did we do? We got our Rusty's Pizza. And you know what we did? We called corporate. And we said, they don't deliver in our neighborhood. A week later, they don't deliver in our neighborhood. A month later, they don't. A year later, they still not delivering in our neighborhood, right? So, years after years, us being discriminated against for living in that neighborhood, right? They still weren't delivering in our neighborhood. Today, they deliver in our neighborhood. How does that correlate with this? So, our youth, right, trying to get the same level of playing field to get the same opportunities. Um, you know, as our male, male counterparts, is it just doesn't start 
from you know the day that you see uh, an inad inadequate uh, opportunity. It might take years. It's kind of taken us years to get to that you know that spot that we're all able to be on the same uh, playing field. So. But it takes someone speaking up and someone calling corporate and someone constantly year after year saying, no, we deserve this. We deserve being on an equal playing field. We deserve equal opportunities. We deserve uh, you know, equal uniforms. We deserve equal time. And so that is my message to our youth today is that you know, we have to really give it up for the people that are before us to get to, to, to for us to be where we are right now, but you guys, as we're passing the torch, has to take it to the next level. If you see something that's not right, then speak up. And if it doesn't get right, then speak up again. And guess what, a year later, if it's not fixed, keep speaking up. Just like we call Domino's and Pizza Hut, because guess what, they deliver in our neighborhood now. I'm glad you got your pizza. Really, I, I am. It seems like a, a minor thing to you guys, but it was a major thing. So right. I, I wasn't totally understanding that would be a, a big deal. And you know, you were talking about um, the inequity and the discrepancies in you know different neighborhoods. Um, I think you maybe could agree that it was like that. You know, in high school sports too, growing up. Um, did you know, I don't mean to go back to high school, but a lot of these athletes are you know high school students. So. Can you maybe talk about the differences in the high school female sports from maybe a school that you went to to like a North High? Because there was a, there was a big difference in, in the actual schools, you know. So what what are your kind of um, thoughts on that? Yeah. So just from like you know a female male perspective, there was always uh, you know our our boys team um, always got the best of the best, the newest uniforms, newest shoes. They always had a team shoe when we all had to contribute and pitch in money to get our team shoe. Um, they got new uniforms every single year when we didn't. I think I had maybe two my whole career. North High, you guys had every year. You guys had like five uniforms. <laughs> Did you guys have like a pink game uniform? <coughs> I think that was after my time. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we weren't able to, you know, have the, uh, the newer things and um, just, uh, you know, what's funny is that now there's a school in LA, I don't know if they do this here in Bakersfield, but um, when the boys and girls play on the same night, um, normally the girls, it's girls JV, then boys JV, then girls varsity, then boys varsity. Did they do that here? Did you guys know different nights? Okay, well they don't do it anymore. Um, in LA, they still have that type of format. Right, and so uh, one of the schools uh, there said that is a violation of, of Title IX because if a parent gets off work at five o'clock, they can't go and see their varsity daughter play, especially in LA traffic, and get there on time. So why should the boys be able to play at seven o'clock and the girls always have to play at five o'clock? That should be flip flop, or or it should be where every other Friday. We should flip flop. So I believe it was at Windward High School where they said, "No, we want to every other Friday the girls are going to be the uh, the premier game at seven o'clock. The boys will be uh, premier at seven o'clock the next game, just so there's an even playing field. And that's all that we're asking for, aren't we? We're not asking for anything else but an even playing field. I remember in our games, as epic as they were, the guys would still come on and play after us, right? In high school." Do you, you remember how many people left after the girls game? That's what I'm saying. They would leave. They would leave and trickle out. So just think about back then, if we would have known, and that's the key right there, is to know our rights and know that we are, we are entitled to speak up and make those type of changes and make those type of suggestions, okay? And from what we learned earlier, if it doesn't happen this year, guess what? Next year, we call them making that change again, and guess what? Doesn't happen next year, guess what? Making that call again. Like, we're constantly, constantly, uh, you know, trying to make a change and uh, speaking up on anything that we see is not right. Absolutely. You know, so just to kind of close things down with us, you're, with the, you're in your second year with the Mercury. Um, what, what kind of uh, future do you see your, your career kind of going in, and, and what do you hope for the, the vision of women in athletics? Um, well, my 
my heart is, has always been to give back to our youth. That's my heart, that's my passion. So, um, you know, the WNBA is nice, but I would love to end up back at the collegiate level where I feel like I have more of an impact on uh, our youth and them becoming women, you know, and their, um, their maturation and, and those types of things. Um, so that's where I eventually want to end up back, end back up. Um, hopefully head coach, we'll see. Um, that's my goal, but you know, my vision for you know this next generation is just for you guys, just like the baby boomers did for our generation, you know, sitting and protesting for civil rights, and so us African Americans can have uh, equality rights. Like it's got to be the same thing for this up next upcoming generation. Like we want you guys to fight for your generation. We want you guys to fight for the generation after you. So there's not even a title line and asterisks at the bottom. It's just a normal thing. Like, it's it, it equal across the board. And you guys have the power to do it. This next generation, like, have you seen their Starbucks orders? They, they're, they're right now type of people, like, they want what they want. They want a mocha, lots of uh, chai with extra whipped cream and one pump of, 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 of uh, raspberry. Cold foam. Yeah. What is full fun? In a, in a venti cup. Like, you know? And they order it on an app now, you can just walk in and pick it up. It's a right now. We had iPhones when we were in high school. It's a right now generation. So just think if they came with that same attitude, like y'all say, same, uh, same, what they say? Same energy. If they came with that same energy, just think of where we would be. Think about where we would be. All you athletes here, you work as hard in, in your sport as you do your Starbucks order. I think that's what we're getting to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, I mean, I know, I know we have to close because I could, you know, obviously talk all day, but you guys know, uh, just a quick story, you guys know the story about the, the carrot, the egg, and the coffee bean. Have you guys heard that? I see some notes out there. Okay, I'll make it quick. All right, so carrot, the egg, and the coffee bean, right? So you have a, a hot pot of water, boiling water. And we're going to call that the circumstance, okay? Circumstances, inequalities, things that we have to go through, the tough things, right? Which one are you, which one are you? Are you a carrot, are you an egg, or are you a coffee bean? The carrot, once it goes into the hot water, what does it do? It gets soft, and right? And gross. And the carrots are gross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the carrots are gross. It gets soft and mushy. So when things get hard, do you cry, Casey Goodman? Do you get soft? I want to, but no. Exactly. We're women. We're not carrots. When we go into those situations, when we go into those tough circumstances, we don't get soft, right? Oh, are you an egg? What does an egg do when it gets into a boil of water? It gets hard, right? And rugged and and almost you can't you can't touch it. You can't reach them. Don't nobody, you don't want to talk to nobody, you get bitter. Right? Those are eggs. You don't want to be an egg either. What does a coffee bean do? <laughs> coffee beans taste good. They give off good aroma. I need coffee every morning. But you know what the coffee does? Instead of letting the boil and water change its texture, it changes the water. It changes the landscape. It changes everything around them. So when things get tough, don't let the circumstance change you. You change it. Y'all are our next generation, and we need y'all to change this climate. We need y'all to change anything that you see wrong, and we're going to be right here passing the torch on to you and relying on you guys. I hope um, everybody in the room today um, can take just a little bit of Nikki's passion and knowledge and um, put that to use in some shape or form and in, in, in moving forward and I, I hope you guys also realize Nikki is a, is a trailblazer when it comes to female athletics and doing the right thing and Nikki we are so glad that you could be here today and share your, your journey with us and, and your wisdom. Appreciate it. Appreciate you, Thank you
I mean, I'm sitting in between two of the best in the state, and so I feel very privileged and honored that I could be included in this panel. You know, I, and, and it is very surreal because in high school, I had the notion that I could play college basketball because my high school coach took me to see who played, Cheryl Miller from USC. I mean, I'm not 6'2", nor was I athletic, but I had the notion that I could play college basketball because my high school basketball coach took me to watch her play. And so the fact that I'm sitting in the same room with the go with Cheryl Miller it's just makes me even more nervous to be up here talking. Uh, so I, I had the opportunity to uh, get a basketball scholarship. Um, I had a career ending injury. And the only thing that made it, made it feel better was to start coaching. And I have just been so fortunate to have female role models, female athletic directors, and people who just kind of paved the way. It never occurred to me that because I'm a woman that I would be held up. And then I got the job, uh, the current role I'm in, I remember my first year on the job and some old white guy said, it's okay that you're in this role and it's okay that you're a woman. Well, we, we would like to work with you anyway. And I'm thinking to myself, that was the first time that I thought, well, well that's odd. He gave me a permission to be a female in, in my job. So thank you. I'm so happy to know that it is okay to be a woman. So anyway, I've, I've really been privileged to have the career and the opportunity I've had. And again, um, no two better female administrators than the ones that are sitting up here at Kenoy and, and Jeannie. So. I'm honored to be part of it. So um, I'm from Berkeley, California, which is close to Santa Barbara, right? Just north of Santa Barbara. And I really didn't know much about Title IX either. It, it became law right before I got into high school. And, you know, I, I know women that were older than me that said they had to play in pennies, which are, well, I don't mean, what are they saying? They're little. They're like the things that soccer players wear when they change colors, so you know who's on offense or defense. Basketball doesn't it too. You're red or white today, you know. So that's what I think. And so I didn't have to do that. We played in a in a league just like the guys did. We took district transportation to and from our games. We you know we played. Every one of the guys played. So I didn't really understand what it was like before. I thought it was always like. And I didn't have a lot of female role models because most of my coaches were males. And then when I got to college and I had a female basketball coach, I thought, well, where's our coach? Because like, she was a woman and not a male. I mean, I don't only have male coaches. And um, so that kind of opened my eyes. And then I transferred and played it. I played at community college and then I played at a four-year school. And I actually played five sports in college. And I had some of the best coaches were female, but I didn't realize it at the time. Because there weren't a lot of female coaches then that were successful and good coaches. Um, and then I went on and started coaching, and I, at first I didn't think I could coach, and everyone's like, no, no, you can coach. And I remember when I, when I was coaching in high school, they would say, well, you know, you treat them, you, you don't treat them like they're girls. I said, well, they're not, they're ballers, you know, they're basketball players. So that was, a, that was kind of weird for me to be saying, you know, you need to, I had an athletic director told me, tell me, you need to treat those players like girls. And I said, that's the problem. They're basketball players, they're not girls when they're come, they come to my court. Um, and then I later on went to Kasunas and started coaching basketball. I started the women's basketball program there. It was extremely hard. I would take over a program in a second and not start another one. Um, and then I eventually moved into, um, I'm the assistant AD, I eventually moved into um, helping coach the coaches, basically. That's great. So, um, it, carrying with that theme and what we did as kids, you know, I, I don't know if some of you have watched the video up on the board with all the pictures, all the old uniforms, the old facilities. That, in our conversations, we, we kind of chuckled about some of that stuff, but 
Um, what's some of the things that we've had to deal with or you've had to deal with as it relates to facilities, upgrading facilities, um, you know, what, what, what we're playing on? Gene, you showed me a picture last night that was pretty impressive. Well, I don't know if it's up there. There's a picture of me playing softball. I was a catch in softball in high school. And the field has weeds all over it. There, it wasn't really grass, it was dirt and weeds. And at the time in high school, we just wanted to play sports, you know, and play softball. So it didn't even dawn on us that the boys' field in high school was perfectly cut, green field, and we were playing on weeds. And it was not fun sliding in that stuff. Um, but those are the kinds of things. I did get to play in a gym. I didn't have to do like Mickey and play outside, thank goodness. Um, but, um, the, you know, there were a lot of facility differences. Our uniforms, some of them were really thick polyester that was just made you sweat. Our coaches made us wear our socks up to our knees, which was really hot. Um, and just, so it was different. I mean, they, I think they tried to make us wear the same, look like the boys, because they're bored. The boys had their socks up, we wanted our socks down. Um, so just things like that. The guys got new uniforms all the time. We got one set of uniforms my entire high school career. We were, it, I played volleyball, basketball, softball, and we wore the same uniform. Every team wore the same uniform. For all three sports? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if there's anybody else that's as old as I am in the room, but we played when we started. It was GAA. Does anybody remember GAA? It's, it's mid Santa, yeah. yeah. right? And we had jumpsuits. We had, ours were blue jumpsuits. <laughs> They were awful. I'm just saying they were awful. Yeah, they were one piece jumpsuits that we played every sport in. Every sport. And they were snap, snap buttons. Yep, they Front. snap. So, so if it wasn't, didn't fit right, you know, it's kind of. <laughs> we had issues. <laughs> and it was really exciting because in GAA, which is Girls Athletic Association, we had what they call play dates where you could go play games, and they actually organized the games for you, but it wasn't really a competition, it was a play date, right? So that's, that's some of the things. You're talking about your softball field. When I played at Fresno State, a Division I school, the year that we won the Super Regionals to go to the College World Series, we played on a field that didn't have a fence. And before the Regionals, the track team carried a set of bleachers from the track all the way over to the softball field so that we could have bleachers at our game and they put up a temporary fence in the outfield. Now that's that's when, you know, you play on an open field, a lot of you I'm sure still do, but it changes the game when it's an open field compared to one with a fence and all that sort of thing. And to not have bleachers, you know, it's just incredible. What, where it was, and if you go to Fresno State now and see their facility, it's just amazing. The other thing we had to do in basketball, we had to be in the gym at 5.30 in the morning because we practiced from 6 to 9. And the guys got all the afternoon and evening. So it was, it was you went to bed when you were, when I was in high school, I went to bed at 8.30 every night. Because I had to be up at 5 and be at school at 5.30. What about, what about issues with your facilities at your institutions where you are now? So I remember um, on that first year I was hired where it was okay that I was a woman, and uh, still am. <laughs> Our baseball, baseball coaches, they're really, they're really they, they take a lot of pride in their field, they do a lot of work, they raise money, so our baseball field was really good, other than baseball's fine at the pool and hitting people while they were swimming, that was bad. Um, but our softball field was across the street and there was one porta potty and the dugouts were I awful. I remember it well. Do you, my teams, you should come, we have a bathroom now. Oh, awesome. back. So, you know, and it took, and I'm thinking, showing up, they went on the job, I'm thinking, I don't know what to do about this. I mean, where do you start? And so, it, it was a lot of effort, a lot of years of documenting why we should have improved facilities, a lot of years. Six facility directors later, four presidents later, uh, we now have a legitimate softball field. And it took, it took you, it's not like you can walk into somebody's office and say, we need this because of Title IX. It would be great if that was the response. We need this because Title IX, the fields are not equitable. 
equitable, but um, anyway, thankfully, after 14 years, we have an equitable field with nice dugouts and a bathroom with a toilet flush um, and stands. So it's, it does take a lot of effort. I kind of forgot that that's kind of where, where we started. It's funny because I see Trisha Gay out here in the audience who coached with me for a number of years, and uh, her family donated money to the Denonated Gay Sports Complex Baseball Softball. And I, one of the things I told Trish, I said, if I die before this facility gets built, just write my name on the bathroom door that Sandy Taylor was here because we stood in line at the baseball field, two teams trying to get in between games to get, you know, what's that, 30, 40 women to be able to use the restroom between games. And I, I swore that before I died, we were going to have bathrooms at the softball field. And we were fortunate enough with Trisha's family's support to be able to do that. So bathrooms are a big thing. <laughs> so I might also just share with all of you, too, that um, we find in athletics that the challenge is real. And still, we're celebrating 50 years. But there's still a lot of challenges when it comes to facilities. And I can say that even on my own campus, we have a similar challenge that we're trying to work through. Uh, my husband coached softball uh, was against Sandy's team uh, for 20 years. And he was our conference rep. And one of the things that our conference coaches asked him to do to represent the conference and write a letter to the administration of one of our schools um, talking about their field. We, I mean, we had equipment stolen from our field while we were on it. Um, it, it. We had to have parents of our student athletes come in the dugout with us um, because it was a, it was not on campus. And now they have a beautiful field on campus, just so you know. And so, in, I, I think my point is, is there's still so many challenges in community colleges. I'll, I'll share one other statistic with you. We have 110 community colleges that right now um, have sports, athletic programs. There's over 130 um, athletic directors and assistant athletic directors in that 110. There are 18 of us that are women. So my point to you is, again, um, we've got to mentor you. We've got to get you in those positions. But I'm just saying that we still have challenges. Even you know, even on my own campus, I have challenges. We worked through some of those challenges um, when my husband was representing softball uh, for our uh, particular conference. But again, we're we're still going to have to work through those challenges and keep talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. What you'll notice, and I love seeing Dr. Christian up here, at the higher levels of California community colleges. They get it. They're about 60 to 70 percent women in the administration. And you saw Dr. Christian naming all of them in your current community college district. So my question or my challenge is, how do we get those similar um, uh, folks, females, in the athletic administrations and allow us to make a difference? And I think part of it's just mentoring. But it's a challenge. We're, we're still doing it now. So the, that message means there's an opportunity, right? A career opportunity for all of you out there to aspire to be in leadership. There's uh, roles in athletics that you can take. One of the things kind of interesting, when I started being an athletic director and going to all the games, my mom says, well, you would go to those games anyway. Because I, I went to every game that there was. And you know, she always gave me a hard time because I was on every night to a game. And, and she says, you'd go to those games anyway. And I said, yeah, but they might as well pay me for it. They don't have to know I'd be there anyway. <laughs> so you know, the, the thing is, is that how do we get all of you involved in leadership in athletics? So what are some of the challenges that we've experienced or heard from our coaches why they can't continue? Uh, you know, families, you know, who's long had hours. long hours? Working weekends and nights and holidays. Yeah, 365 days a year, you know, there's not a downtime. Um, women talk all the time about, you know, how can they manage their household? We've had a lot of that, you know. What sort of things have you guys experienced? Well, 
work-life balance, right? And I mean, I think I'm still work. When I look around at some of uh, the other females who have leadership roles, I'm constantly impressed that you know, Kanoi is the, a mom and a wife. Um, I'm a proud aunt, and I'm really not sure how I would have done it. And I, there's probably better advice to give than what I could, but. Um, I think that it's kind of an ongoing challenge to take care of yourself, appreciate yourself, um, and, and work hard at what you do. I had a coach call me yesterday, actually um, an athletic director who was a former softball coach, and he called me yesterday because we're looking for a softball coach as well. And he's retiring at the end of the year and said, can I come coach for you part-time? I said, you're retiring, why would you do that? He said, because I'm going from 70 hours a week to nothing. And he said, I want something to do. I want to come back to Central Valley. I'm the coach. So a big challenge is the number of hours that you're going to have to work. But I will never forget my mom telling me, don't ever get outworked. And I can promise you, I'm not going to get outworked. I am not going to let that happen. Um, and our, uh, our challenges are real. We help each other. Who do we pick up the phone when we have issues? Uh, we, we contact each other. We talked about family challenges. I was very lucky because my husband was also a coach. And with our son, he coached in the spring and I coached in the fall. And so we split responsibilities because that, that balance with home life and work life is very, very difficult. And I was lucky to have someone that we could split those responsibilities. But it's real when you become a mom and then you feel guilty that you missed uh, one of your child's games, it's painful. It is painful. So we got to support each other. We've got to encourage each other um, and help each other through the, this kind of process. And we had a very talented coach here that uh, decided that she didn't want to continue coaching because she felt like she couldn't be the best mom that she wanted to be. Um, and we shouldn't have to make those choices, but it's part of the role of women, right? You, you are the keeper of the household, so to speak. But to, to know that you can share with your partner is the best thing. I remember my oldest daughter said, can you not schedule a softball game on my birthday this year? Uh, so, you know, some little things that you could do to help make the kids happy. But, um, you know, there, it is a challenge, but the opportunity is there. And it was funny, uh, last night we were watching a basketball game. Of course, I've watched basketball 24-7 the last few days. And we were watching Oklahoma play, and this little girl in the stands was just screaming to beat the band, the eight-year-old with the OU sh shirt on. Turns out it's the coach's daughter sitting in the stands, and I thought, you know, she representation matters, and it matters in everything that we do. But, you know, there weren't eight-year-old girls in the stands when we were kids, you know, watching games like that. And we certainly didn't have our mom in a position that we could watch. So, um, Representation really does matter. So what other kind of stories do we want to share with these, these young women and professionals to be? I guess the one thing I would say is, you know, it took me a long time to find my voice. And even now, my tendency is to sit in the back of the room and not speak up. And so I would just say to you young athletes, you know, find your voice and don't be scared to talk out loud. Um, and, and be yourself and be who you are because um, life's too short. I mean, you all have something to offer. Um, don't hide behind it. You, you all have smart things to say and great things to do. And so I just would encourage you to, you know, not sit in the back of the room. Take, take the opportunity to raise your hand and speak up and get out there. And that would be my advice. I throw something out here too. Surround yourself with people that are going to help you move forward. Um, I just mentioned the challenge in community college athletics is that we really are dominated by the men in athletics. And so in order to navigate this particular system that I'm in with community colleges, was some of my mentors were men. And um, so that I learned from them how they did it, so I can do it too. You, not just you can do this, I can do what you do and I can do it better. But surround yourself with folks that are going to help you reach the goals that you're trying to reach. 
and knowing too, um, I just love it when people have said, I want to be a head coach. I did not aspire to be an athletic director. I can promise you that. I went to, into business. Um, and am I forever grateful that I had a female that brought me into the fold and got me started in athletics. That was not the direction I was going to go and I'm forever grateful to her for doing that. And I would say um, it's really important for you guys to network with other, with, with people like yourself, talk to your friends. Don't be afraid to talk to your friends and ask questions. I mean, I remember when I first became a, a, a AD, I was so afraid I thought I'd have to figure out everything myself, I have to do this, and I have to know this. And you know, the guys, because they've done it so long, network very well together. And I would go to our athletic director meetings and I'd sit out on the camera, sit in the back, I didn't say anything, I just kind of listened. And then I was like, well, wait, maybe I can ask that person, maybe I can ask that person. You know, I mean, like these guys said, we have a question, the first people I call right here. You know, we just call each other, ask, hey, what's your opinion on this? Don't be afraid to do that. And, and it's really important for you to be a good communicator because I didn't aspire to be an athletic director either. I wanted to be a coach. That's all I wanted to do. And our dean said, you're the athletic director. You're the, the, the assistant athletic director. I said, no, no, I'm not. I'm the basketball coach. And so the dean said, no, if I write an assignment, it's you. So when your boss tells you that, you kind of have to do it. Um, but I was really afraid to, to ask questions because I thought, I don't know build up, you know, what am I supposed to do? And then, oh, you're in charge of all these coaches and you mentor these coaches. And I was like, well, who's my mentor? So don't be afraid to reach out and network and talk to each other and get ideas from each other. You know, you brought up the networking and the men have done it for so long. The traditions that men's athletics have and women are just getting there, right? Alumni giving back to their programs. Uh, when I played, there were no alumni to the softball program, Fresno State. So if our class of 1982 doesn't give back to the, uh, you know, the team now, they don't know where it was. And we were fortunate we got together last year and met with all our teammates. And to be able to start networking with them again and to celebrate our, our successes, but was also to give back to the program through scholarships, and we, we developed a couple of scholarships that we're all donating to over time, and it just felt good to be part of giving back to your programs. So advocating for yourselves, but also advocating for the youth, like Nikki said, give back. You all can do clinics with young athletes too. Go to the Bobby Sox or to the, you know, whatever youth leagues there are, Get involved as assistants, get involved and watch because you have knowledge that you can share starting now and you, you can develop yourself as you go. Unlike us, we didn't have any of those, you know. Um, I did grow up playing outside on the blacktop basketball course with Levi's on and knee pads on. Um, so I didn't have any of those opportunities, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> I was wearing That's jeans. Cool. I was wearing jeans. I'd tear my jeans if I didn't have knee pads on. I can't do that. Although now I'd be in style with holes in my jeans. I, I don't have that. <laughs> yeah, I grew up out in the country and we played, you know, I high jumped into sawdust. That's how old I am. I high jumped into sawdust. And you know, I can't high jump very high. So that hurt. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I can tell you some stories. Let me just say. Anything else that we'd like to share? I mean, I think advocating at our level is difficult. Um, you know, somebody asked recently about how do you how do you go to your administration and ask for, ask for funding? You know, and dollars are short. How do you go about that? How do you fundraise in your communities? Do you find yourselves having trouble fundraising if you're on the women's side or being a woman networking? I mean, you know, guys, they make a lot of money on the golf course in a hurry. Uh, I, I took, took up the golf career. because the guys did. Yeah. I did, I took up golf for that reason. Yeah. And we do, oftentimes at our conventions, we're with the guys. We're playing golf with the guys because I want to know what they're talking about and I want to duplicate what they're doing and make it better. Absolutely, and I think they gain respect for 
us as athletes because we can play right alongside them. Well, some of us can play alongside them. <laughs> I can't play golf. But I'm running a golf tournament. You you both invited. April 3rd, we call it the final four of ORE. That's good. See, she's not afraid to ask, you guys. She's not afraid to ask. That's what you have to do. Yeah, any other crazy story you want to share? I mean, I, we talk forever in our own little world, but I'm not sure what all you are interested in out there. I'd just like to say, I, I want to thank all the women and the men who came before me and fought for Title IX and made it possible for me to do what I do and to be able to play as I did as an athlete. And I think it's really important for us to know our history and how things came about. Because if we don't, we're going to make a lot of the same mistakes. And moving forward, we, there, is, there is a lot that needs to be done. We've come a long way. We have a long way to go. But I want to thank those pioneers that came before me because without them, I would not have the opportunities that I had. Absolutely. I would actually uh, ditto that and, and also say to you, I, as I mentioned earlier, my, I did not intend to be an athletic director, but there is so much joy in knowing that we have the ability to change lives because somebody did that for me. And as Jeannie talked about, we have folks before us that did this, and now I am now, I think it's my responsibility to mentor, to reach out, um, to be here and talk about it because somebody did that for me, and the beauty is we get to change lives because somebody did it for us. Uh, one, thing, one thing I would like to say before we wrap up our deal is, you could go out and, and shadow somebody. If you think you might be interested in a position, go shadow them for a day or a week and see how what the job <coughs> is. Um, I had a student athlete that has left here, you know, a long time ago, and he was thinking about, he was thinking about going into this other position. And I said, well, what do they do in that position? He said, I don't really know. I said, well. You should go spend some time there. You know, you don't want to go into a job that you don't haven't been there before. Um, so go out and shadow people, do some things like that, and get yourselves involved. Um, I want to encourage you to get started at a young age and start dreaming. For whatever reason, I knew I always wanted to be an athlete. They didn't even have teams when I was a kid, but I knew I wanted to do that. Um, and so now it, it gives me a great deal of joy to be here and see all of you with the opportunities that we didn't even knew could exist when we were your age. So go out, get involved, do what you love, and advocate for what you love on a daily basis. And there's the world is out there. There's so much you could do. And it's just a, a great joy. I want to thank these three ladies because they took a day away from their jobs to be here today. And as an athletic director, that's not an easy thing to do. So for them to be here, they made a great sacrifice. But they are extremely important to me in my life. And I want to say thank you for coming. And I appreciate you. Even in retirement, it's still a joy. I miss you tremendously. But it is um, fun to get back together and talk about all the times. And, um, just, it's a great day. So thank you all, and thanks for being here. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I hope you've enjoyed yourselves to this point. Uh, we're gonna let you take a short break. Uh, there's probably still a little bit of food out here. Over the side, yeah, thanks, Kim. Um, if you go to the side, we have, if you haven't gotten them, if we still have some, we have red Title Night t-shirts that are free. And then for $10, you can get one of these, and we'll tell you the story behind this one in just a little bit. So take a break, restrooms are over here, books are for sale, and uh, yeah.
shooting this for the school website or something that we Oh, oh, are you going to put this Thank <laughs> you. 
just contribute to what we're doing. Thank you so much. So, I'm going to introduce the introducer here real quick. Several years ago, uh, one of my assistant coaches and I, I, I got one here, Emery Ozerall, that I've worked with my entire career. We were talking about our concerns with fundamentals. And then we need to get better at fundamentals. Yeah. And um, and so we started a basketball academy. Some of you have been to our academy, and we appreciate that. And we encourage people taking notes. And this young gal, she was young, junior high, taking just copious notes. That's what we need to really detailed notes. And then afterwards, she comes up. And she's like, coach, and just wanted instruction and guidance and what to do. You know, we've talked about goals and knowing what you want. I would love for her to come play here. But this is a young woman that stayed completely focused in what she wanted to do. All League, I think she's All League MVP. I don't know if they brought out, I've been looking for the um, All Area. But more significantly, she had academic dreams that were far beyond us. And so she's going to continue to play basketball at the next level, but she's going to play at one of the most elite institutions in our country, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And it's a massive honor. And so I asked Jordan Toller to uh, please come up and introduce Sharp. Hello. It is my pleasure to introduce a trailblazing woman who has forever changed the conversation around women's basketball. During her four seasons at USC, the Riverside native achieved All-American honors four times, brought home two NCAA championship titles, and earned three Most Outstanding Player awards. She led the U.S. women's Olympic team to its first ever Olympic gold medal, and later the U.S. national team to two more international gold medals. After she hung up her sneakers, she became the head coach at her alma mater of USC, becoming later a commentator for the National Basketball Association, 
the first woman ever to commentate for a men's nationally televised basketball game. She later continued her trailblazing as the head coach for the Phoenix Mercury of the Women's National Basketball Association before taking on the head coach role at Langston University. Her ability as a pure scorer and an amazing rebounding presence etched her name in the USC Hall of Fame having her jersey retired and her name now resides in the Naismith Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Cheryl Miller. City College, and we'll talk a little bit, but she is why we all have these shirts. Turn around, Alicia. And this is why we all deserve to be here. So, nice! Oh, yeah, yeah, we try. We try. Um, so, I remember the first time I met Cheryl I was in Boston. I got to find that picture because she won't ever remember that. And uh, the second time I met her was as a result of my buddy here. And, you know, we've talked about, we, we have talked about the importance of supporting each other as women. And, and it's something that is really, really important. We don't want to be in competition with each other. We want to support and strengthen and make, you, make, make each other stronger. And so, in our coaching ranks, we have what's called our wolf pack. And Cheryl, for a long time, was an honorary member. And, and just recently, she proved herself enough that she could actually become a full member of the Wolf Pack. And um, I, I know of all the accomplishments that we've talked about, that is truly in her heart the greatest one that she's achieved to be welcomed into our pack. So. so Cheryl, basketball player, older brothers, how did it all start? Being beaten up. I have two older brothers. I'm smack dab in the middle. And of course, it's Reggie and my younger sister, Tammy, who are four years old or so. Being a middle child, I have issues. Man, that explains <laughs> so much. Issues. So much. But before we get started, really, really started, can all the men in here please raise your hand? Please raise your hands. Hi. Okay, guys, I want you to know you're in this struggle with us. And thank you for being here this afternoon. Because sometimes, I mean, men will turn their ears off. And because we're always nagging, they get it at home. And now they're getting it at work. So they're not trying to hear us. But when you step up, your voice sometimes is much, much louder. And we need to both be on the same team. So it's not about male bashing up here. There's a lot of handsome men out here anyways, but yeah. <laughs> so let's all aim. We're, we're just team quality. Team quality. <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot about growing up with guys that we oh, really yeah. understand that. It, it's, it was a battle. It was a battle to get a piece of toast and extra bacon. Um, there was always a um, fist fight. Trying to get extra aid, scramble, you want some cheese on it, well, that's going to cost you a tooth. So, uh, you know, it was a I think I remember you guys talking about basketball games in your yard and people getting thrown in bushes. Thrown in bushes. Um, whenever you were trying to make an extra pass, you tried to make sure that the person was close enough to the driveway when someone was backing out so there was an injury <laughs> in place and possibly happening. But again, um, and, and that's why I have such a strong affection uh, for men, because you guys look at us as equals, and as competitors, and as athletes. 
So continue to pass that on to your players. And young ladies, I, I know you've been hearing, um, we want you to speak up. Don't speak up if you don't have anything positive to say. I'm just gonna keep it 100% up here. And another thing, and please don't get all up in your feelings because we need you to buy some t-shirts. <laughs> but you need to get tougher. You need to get much, much tougher. Because if you have an issue, with your coaches barking at you. Can you imagine your employers and you been, you getting all caught up in your feelings because you might have been late. You missed something at the office that you should have done, an assignment, and you're going to get all up in your feelings and you know what happens after that? You're fired. And remember this, ladies, myself included, I wanted the hard, a very hard way. Everybody is replaceable. Everybody. I don't care what color, what gender, what religion, you're replaceable. You're replaceable. So put your best foot forward. Challenge each other. You don't have to like each other. I don't like anybody up on the stage. <laughs> oh, come on, you like JT. I do. I do now. I do now. You kind of messed up my, my intro a little bit. I messed that up a little bit. I'm gonna give you a little break on that. No worries. Let's get a correct head something. So you talk a little bit about doing doing some hard stuff. You know, a lot of people think, oh yeah, I want to go to USC. I, I don't know how often, you know, we have our camps. What are your goals? I want to I want to play D1. I want to be the WNBA. What does that really mean? What does that take? What does that look like? It's everything you have on and off the court. More so off the court. It's your character. It's being able, when I say that you, you've got to, you have to, not you got to, you must toughen up. Because out there, they're going to tell you everything you're not. Everything you're not. And I'm just blessed that I didn't grow up because you guys have a tough social media. I would have choked somebody out by now. <laughs> and I, if I didn't have enough likes and everything else, I'm waiting and knocking at somebody's doorstep. But with that also being said, you can't listen. What does your heart say? What does your spirit say? You are who you are, not what anybody else says. So when I say tough skin, it starts now. Parents, stop telling your kids who they are. Not yet, please. You got a, your daughter is five foot five, and you're saying she's gonna be the next Lisa Leslie. Kid, kid, on. Stop the madness on that. Parents. I'm going to save you some money. All these traveling camps in there. I need to start that. That's a great business. I'm going to charge your kids who can't play. $700. I'll take it. I will be in agreement. Chit-chit. Uh, uh, give me your VMO, VF, VOI, whatever. Yes. Get, get, get cash. Stop it, parents. Stop driving your kids all over Kingdom Come where they don't even want to play a sport. Didn't have to crack open the book. Not everybody is cut out to be an athlete. I was, and I was forced into it. I just didn't jump really good. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love this woman. You were great. 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 No, not at all. I told you not to bring me up here. Not at all. Not at my will call. So, you know. What 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 does it I think I think these athletes in here need to understand what a training day really looks like if you want to be. I just I, actually you can speak more of it. And first of all, congratulations. God bless you. Sunday's coming up. I'm gonna be in prayer because I would want to be a coach. I tried coaching again, choking one of you guys out. <laughs> I was close. I was about to catch a case. That's why I'm not For real. 
You tell me what you guys go through. You tell me. I want to know because I want to look. Just say something so I can look at somebody. I, I, I'm, I looking right at, I'm looking I'm right, right at you. At you. If all of the moderator are you the moderator? I told you not to bring me up here with the money. Now, you guys, tell, seriously, I want to know what you guys battle against and how we can help these young ladies. We can't. It's one thing to, to pull you. It's another thing to push you. And I'm sorry, at 59, I'm not pushing no one anymore. I'll try to be inspiring, but at the end of the day, it's your feet, it's your butts, it's your character, it's your life. Do something about it. Nobody out there is going to give you anything. You came back there looking for these t-shirts, they ain't free. There ain't no freebies here. <laughs> life is not free. Hard work and what you want to achieve does come at a price. And all it takes, if you want to know what it takes to be successful, all you have. All you have and embrace the word no. Let it be your motivator. Now tell me, let me get back. Please tell me what you have to do with these the, young The question was at a D1 level, yeah. right? And just so you all know, because Trojan, we met Mickey, the UCLA Bruin, but I'm the Washington State Cougar, so let's just go on the record with one of the Pac 12 this year. We have that on camera? Pac 12. I would like to say for those of you that want to, my girl, those of you that want to be a D1 athlete, you truly have to know what it is to sacrifice. You know, and I went through the junior college ranks, right, community college, and ended up at Washington State. And every single day is truly a grind. My athletes now, when I coach, I can barely get them to a two-hour practice. When you're, when I was at Washington State. Five in the morning, you're on the track working out. Then you go have breakfast. Then you go to class. Then you come back and you do individual workouts. Then you go eat again. Then you go for two hour practice. Then you go eat again. Then you go in the weight room. And your day starts at five, ends at eight or nine. And oh, wait a minute. It's that thing called studying. You have to somehow, in that schedule, manage your time, do your work, and be able to be successful. And like I said, at a community college, I can barely get my athletes to get to tell practice. D1 and Instagram. D1 is a whole stuff. different level. Oh, please. What, you think I'm not going to get there by watching TikTok? No. No. I don't even know what it is, you know. What is it? I do. I'm addicted to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every time I'm going to say, Alicia and Emery can hook you up with what TikTok is all about. And, and I think these female athletes here, they got you, Cheryl. They'll be able to get, order their, their Starbucks and show you TikTok at the same exact time. There might even be a TikTok on how to order your Starbucks. <laughs> I'm so, so, Cheryl, let's, you, you, NCAA Final Four, NCAA National Championship, uh, Player of the Year, MVP, you know, great teammates. Talk about that experience. I'm guilty of all of them. Oh, gold medalist, gold medalist. Yeah, let's, 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 let's talk. <laughs> I know. Uh, I just look. I, I just I, I've been blessed, and to be honest, I am. I, I'd rather hear people laughing and you know trying to mix in the seriousness. And as much as I love the talk, I want to know the struggles. And why, why, Coach, just please let them know what and why we're wearing these shirts and why I now got involved and why now I possibly have a record with the police later. <laughs> well, the real question is how much time do I have to tell the story? So, currently at Riverside City College, um, where I graduated from, I was in the Hall of Fame there. I played on the basketball team. Never in a million years did I think I was going to be in a battle with the institution that I love so much and still love, for the record, this is on live stream, anybody watching, from Riverside, I love you. 
But sometimes there's battles that you just can't let go. And this shirt came from the women's basketball team finally getting an opportunity to be in the weight room. Do you guys remember the NCAA March Madness? The women having yoga mats and the little weights? And then the men having the huge ballroom? Well, we were actually lifting weights because we finally had a VP that spoke up and said, why can't the women go in the weight room? So we had our time. And the minute we got in there, the men's football team decided to walk in and take the weights right off the racks as we were working out because they were going to work out outside the weight room and take our time. Now, this was last season. Last we're not year. talking several years ago, and we're grateful here. We have equal opportunity for our weight room. We've got everything. We're really blessed here. But this was last season. So last season, in the very last game, our sophomore night, we decided we were going to do something as a team. And so we came up with these shirts. And it was our little protest. We weren't throwing tomatoes on the court. We were just wearing these shirts and warm-ups with Orange Coast College. And the message on the front is for all women's sports. Our athletes came up with a message, right? Equality in women's sports. And on the back, we deserve to be here. And then it just kind of took a life. And I like Nikki's message about keeping things positive. No matter what I've been through at that institution or my athletes have gone through, this is a positive message. This is moving forward. This is keeping Title IX relevant. And it's just really kind of taken a life of its own. And um, we're just going to keep the message going. And I mean, I, could, I would not, I do not want to damper this stage with the things that I've been through. I do. <laughs> but hey, anyway, so I, I do because, like, again, it's not a battle, it's a lawsuit. And if you go online, since everybody wants to Google and find out everybody's business, this is real, real. This is her livelihood. You know, there's no stop and pass go and collect your 200 because if she doesn't win this lawsuit, that's it. And as women, once we get the boot, once we stand up and we don't win, there's a 99.9911999% chance she'll never coach again. Well, let me stop you right there. I already I filed you know, I'm one lawsuit and I won the lawsuit. So you know what I'm going to do with the second lawsuit? I'm going to win it again. And you want to know why? Because I have to And it's the truth. When you have an institution that makes you try to coach from a wheelchair, did you see me walk up on the stage? I don't belong in a wheelchair. This season, I had to put up with a men's basketball team slamming balls against the doors, yelling at us to get out of our practice time. I have been yelled at that I am the big bad wolf, right, on campus. I, um, a mini victory, and on a positive note, I thought this was pretty funny. They were arguing, and I think Nikki brought it up about who gets to play the later game. Well, guess who was the higher seed this season? The women. <laughs> and the women didn't like it very much that we got to play the 7 p.m. game. And then we went on the road, and the best part is walking out in, the, out in front, and there was two buses. And there was a smaller bus and a bigger bus. And I said, oh, Lord, here we go. Women are probably going to get the smaller bus, right? But guess what the women got? The bigger bus. And a coach was running up to me. Wait, that can't be your bus, the men's coach. That's our bus. I said, see ya. That's our bus. Okay? <laughs> So you do need to speak up, and, um, and I am going to win that lawsuit very confidently because everything in the lawsuit is fact and truth. There is no allegations. It's fact and truth, but I know they have to call it legally allegations right now. Um, so I am going to win it, and I am going to win it with the support of these ladies here and the Wolfpack and the ladies back there that coach community college women's basketball. So this is real. We actually took this shirt to the state tournament last year. You'll see some of the pictures up there of all the coaches wearing them. Cheryl and I are on a tour right now, is what we call it. We're going to be at the Final Four. And so we're going to have those shirts up there at the Final Four as well. And so those are the shirts. Follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram. Equality in women's sports. You guys got that?
Thank you. And, and I think this is just the epitome of supporting each other. I'm trying to ask Cheryl questions about all the incredible things that she's accomplished, but she wants to be relevant to the here and now and support. And that's what it's all about. As we learn to support each other, we become stronger. As we learn the importance of working together, working together, we have an impact. And that's what this is all about. You are our future. You are our change agents. And I have 100% confidence in every one of you. I believe if you decide that you want to make a difference, you will make a difference. You have technologies and understanding that Berger and I don't get at all. We're talking this morning. How do you do this? I don't know. Let's Google it. What do I You can make incredible things happen. Now, once again, we'll try to see if we can Cheryl to talk about Cheryl for a second. I know, I know, which is huge. The humility, the integrity, the genuine is unbelievable. Uh, does anybody have a question? Ladies, do you have a question out there? I mean, a legit question. Something that is in your spirit or on your mind that you would like to ask. Come on now. Let me let me say something real quick, because I know everybody got quiet when we started using the word lawsuit. Don't be scared. <laughs> Don't be scared. <laughs> Speak up. Hello. Oh, I'm gonna stand up. You can do whatever you want, Coach. I'll just like I I'm I'll be I'm I'll be 58, so I remember when you were going into into sports casting, and I would like for you to kind of share your experiences with that because it was it was kind of a big deal for all of us watching you move, make that move. So I would like for you to share that if possible. Well, I, I was blessed, obviously, because of um, having great teammates, great coaches, a great university, USC, getting my degree in communication. So making the transition uh, to the NBA was fantastic. 17 years with, with TNT, loved it. Interviewing the cream, the best, the cream, the cream, cream, the cream, the top players, Kobe, Shaq, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, uh, the kid with the big ears, Reggie Miller. <laughs> And lest you, be, lest you be confused, Reggie Miller is Cheryl Miller's little brother. That's true. Not the other way around. Not the other way around. Not the other way around. No, it's not the other way around, but I'm the underpaid Miller. Actually, <laughs> talk about that, the discrepancies there. It is huge. And it wasn't really until, because there was, there was a time, there was a, a period being with, with TNT where you're just happy to be there. I mean, I was making six figures, and that's a big deal for me, big, big deal. And it wasn't until my eighth season um, when, well, once Reggie retired, he came to, came to TNT to, to broadcast. So of course, everything's a competition. And so, you know, I said, well, Reggie, you know how much I made. And I said, how much did they have? No way, no way, there's no way Rich is gonna get, you know, a, a bigger salary than I am. And his paycheck was 1.75 more than mine. 1.75. And I love Reggie to death, but I love the bills more. <laughs> but I noticed even in even with my education, with my accomplishments, there is still a barrier in quality when it comes to salaries. But we just gotta keep, number one, flooding all these areas, all the workplaces that, that are male-dominated, male-dominated because we need to step in and be a part of that. 
we need to open the door for each other. But until we get to the point where we're not, I don't want to be close to, I want to be equal or above. That needs to be our mentality. So again, if it's happening to me, and it happened to me, I guarantee it'll happen to you. Speak up. Fair, fair, equality. You deserve it. You deserve it. Put your best foot forward. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody? Good morning. Um, so and you stood up. I, you know what? I'm proud of you. <laughs> you know, seriously, I'm, I'm proud really of nervous. you. <laughs> no, don't be nervous. Um, so more, I'm a volleyball player. So more and so on as I get older and I keep playing volleyball. Um, I feel like I keep on meeting rooms where um, I'm undermined or I feel like I'm not supposed to be there or I feel like they don't want me to be there. How should I take it? Well, they don't. Okay, except the fact that you're gonna have to fight. And there's gonna be some people, look, it, it, it's not that everybody is against you, okay? Let's take that off the board, okay? It just simply means you need to step your game up and you need to be your best cheerleader. You, you truly do. But understand, there are gonna be obstacles. There's, there'll probably be a lot of roadblocks. But again, love, accept, grab, grasp, hold on to, no, because that's going to be your motivator. And just, just listening to you, articulate, you're beautiful, get after it, and go for it. Don't you dare let anybody tell you who you are and what you can and can't do. Thank you. Thank you. is um, talking about the pay gap with what would you tell these uh, young students or, or athletes um, that are constantly hearing that uh, women don't deserve equal pay because of um, maybe their sports not bringing in as much revenue as the men's sports? Yeah, that, that's, that sounds good on paper. You know, it sounds good when, when, when they're saying students that leave their mouth, that's not true. There are, there are a lot of sports that may not generate the same revenue. That's just fact. Basketball, football, doesn't mean it's less exciting, whether it's softball, a water polo, whatever it may be. And, and please, when they start saying major, minor sports, no, sports, period. But at the end of the day, how exciting? How, how is your program? Are you drawing in the top athletes? Um, what are, you know, the revenue that you bring in sometimes doesn't show up on, on the books, but are your kids graduating? Are they graduating with honors? That should be the driving force. And yes, it, it, you, you need to be paid, and that's just a matter of just keep it up. Just keep it out there. Just keep pushing and grinding and grinding. If your players see you grinding, they'll do the same thing. And that's where we're really lucky at this level. Because pay is the same. Yeah. <laughs> Can I not ever think that, that coaching thing again? <laughs> <laughs> not ever think that one. Oh, I'm sorry. Know. So, BC? <laughs> I might come and join BC. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I know earlier you talked to something that I really liked was you need to keep a positive voice on this and that you need to keep going at it in a positive manner that shows that you're working for change and that you want to team up rather than ever get combative. How do you find your voice and remain confident in that voice while also staying positive and making sure that everyone knows that you are willing to collaborate? Then let me return the question. When did you find your voice and how did you find it? When did I find my voice? I'm looking at you. <laughs> I found my voice my freshman year. I went through a season-ending injury, and it was when I lost my voice. 
I completely lost my voice because basketball, it was my identity. It was everything I ever did. And then once I figured out that I'm a person outside of the sport, I'm a person with dreams outside of this sport, and that I have plans that are outside of this sport that make me a better athlete, that was when I found my voice because I realized I am so much more than just sneakers and a jersey. Now, follow-up question. How many, how many young ladies were in, were, were your friends that motivated you um, and, and kind of pushed you along and, were, and, and was your support system? And be honest. Um, honestly, I felt that, you know, within my team it was less than supportive just because, you know, they're still looking, they're looking to push on with the season and they're looking to keep moving forward. But it was the parents in my life, the aunt, my aunt is somewhere in the back right now in my life. And it was just, it was the coaches that stuck with me. And it was just as much even then, I had coaches that reached out and said, hey, I understand what you're going through, I've been there. And it was just the people that said, hey, I've been here, I've done it and I got through it. Those were the people that really just that's awesome. That is awesome. Any more questions? I got one right here. Yeah, I was getting hungry. Um, okay, so <laughs> I uh, so I kind of have two questions within these together. So one is, what would you recommend is the best way to like get yourself out there if you don't have a voice that you're like if you're afraid to speak up and it's really hard for you? That like, what's the best way to do that? And then what's your uh, advice as to if there's someone like in power uh, in front of you and they're preventing you from doing something, what would you recommend to fix that problem? Because recently I have been trying to promote to sergeant. I'm in a uh, military program and the person above me has been causing a lot of problems. He hasn't really been there for the entire like squadron. So I was stuck not knowing what to do and like, he's the top dog, so what do I do? Where do I go after that? Can I, can I answer that? You become the top dog. You find a way to get to the top, right? And, and everybody, when you're young, you don't have a voice, right? You're, you're trying to figure yourself out, right? You don't have the courage to come up and do this. But years ago, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the courage to walk up here with the microphone and sit next to the goat over here. Um, <laughs> She hates when I call her the goat, but I love doing that. Um, but you surround yourself with people that have a voice. And if you look at that lady standing there, Paula Dahl, I went to a meeting for the state um, tournament, a general body meeting, and she was so passionate about something that we were voting on, she stood up, she commanded the room, and I looked at her and I said, I want to be her. I want to be Paula Dahl. And it was going to take courage to do that. But if she could do that, I can do that. So in that room years ago, we won't tell you how many years ago that was, but years ago, what you're doing right now, you just took the first step for people to hear your voice. Young lady. You have a voice. You have, you have a voice. You have courage. The courage. Now do that every time you're in a room and it just gets easier and easier. And just become that top dog. And you show up every day so that people can look up to you. Surround yourself with, with people that have the same mindset that you do. Surround yourself so you can have that positive feedback. I'm very proud of you. Very proud of you. That was awesome. You know, sometimes we have to work a lot harder than other people. But we can do it. And that's just the reality. We gotta put in the time. We can't just talk about this is what I want. No, you gotta be it. You gotta put the time in day in and day out. It does not happen by chance. And that's what I kept trying to get Cheryl to talk about. It doesn't happen by chance. You gotta put the work in. You gotta be willing to fall on your face. You know, we talk about mental health. We talk about self-esteem issues. You know how you get your self-esteem higher? Do you know how you build your self-esteem? 
Go do something hard. Don't let your parents bail you out. Figure it out for yourself. Fall flat on your face and go, you don't got me, I'm getting back up again. And I'm going to learn from that and I'm going to get stronger and I'm going to get better. That is how you build your self-esteem is you do something extremely hard and you go, I just did that. You preach it, Paula. You preach it. I love it. Love it. No more questions? I got somebody out there right now. Look at that. I have a question. Oh, there we go. Finally got the courage. Let's go. That's good. I didn't get my walk in this morning. I get a little bit in. Um, so I throw shot put, which um, most sports are already seen as masculine, but shot put specifically is really seen as a male sport because it's mainly lifting weights, building muscle, like it's very testosterone. And because of that, there is almost this atmosphere of you have to lose the feminine, the feminine touch in yourself to be able to compete and to be taken seriously. And I just want to know, as female athletes that are recognized, um, what would you recommend in finding a way to bring awareness of, I'm a girl, I can do this sport too, but that doesn't mean I have to stop looking like a girl or acting like a girl. That I can be a girl and throw this shot put just as far as any man can. Okay. I'm going to put this one on because I was the biggest tomboy. But I can do my hair and I can look pretty too. You don't have to change who you are. You don't have to start being more masculine or not wear makeup. I mean, good Lord, you see the LSU player, Reese? She lost an eyelash the other night. My daughter and I were sitting there watching. Is she going to go put it back on during half time? And she did. And she did. Um, but you don't have to change who you are. You love doing the shot put. I threw the shot put, discus, and javelin. My daughter right now, a freshman in high school, Chucks that shot put. She loves it. And then she is a diva. Mom, when you're gone, oh, dad's going to put nails on me. And I said, oh, Lord, those things are expensive. Don't you ever change who you are. You don't have to become more masculine to be do a sport. Are you kidding me? No way. Be who you are. And Cheryl, what is your quote? Dare to be different. Dare to be different. Dare to be different. Don't change. Don't change for anybody. Don't, don't change for a significant other. Nope. Don't change for a coach. Nope. Don't change. Be you. Be you. <laughs> Any more questions? Because I was that one in the room. Should I ask? Should I ask? Should I do it? There's going to be one more. Oh, look at that. Oh, there we go. All right, one with it. Um, so good morning. So this isn't really like a question that's regarding me necessarily, but my teammate is transitioning right now. And so every game that we play, like at the club, or like even in high school, he would have to go out onto the field and have like everybody question him, like just facing discrimination every game. Like we just came back from like a showcase right now. And after the game, they're all like coming after him because he appears to be a guy, and he's transitioning right now, but, you know, biologically, he was still a girl, so he's still able to play, like, girl soccer. So, what are some things that you feel like we could do to help take care of it, I guess? What kind of support system um, do they have? Does he or she, now, is, is, what does she recognize that? Is it she? He's recognized as he. As he? He, him, yeah. Okay. What's his support system like at home? Um, I think he relies like a lot on like his parents and like his friends and all that mm -hmm. because everybody that knows him, mm -hmm. they're close with him. Like you have his back, you always have his back. So, right. Especially on the team, we're very protective of him. Mm -hmm. So if you know some girls can hit him because they don't like that, some girl can't run into him because he appears as a guy. Or just because he's a goalie, and we just have his back, so pretty much everybody's his support system that's in his life. Mm -hmm. And if you're not his in his life, you're not his support system. 
Well, the best thing you're doing right now is, number one, you're speaking out about it because that's a major issue now. That's a huge issue. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to sit up here and, and lie to you because I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. I know it makes people uncomfortable, and I understand that, but it's something that we have to embrace, you know, and talk about, and find out a common, a common goal where we're, we're comfortable, and we're moving in the right direction, because there are too many young people who are transitioning and not having the support, and they're killing themselves. They're killing themselves. Which is sad. I think one of the things that we that we really need to think about is that no one is greater than or less than anybody else. And if we can look at everybody that way, no one is greater than or less than anybody else. And that doesn't matter who you are, but if we can just look at individuals like that and just love people, that's what it's all about. One, I have a really good friend. I once said to her, it's not my job to judge you, it's just my job to love you. And as we remember that, it's not our job to judge anybody, but it is our job to love people. It is our, and, and it's like, do you want to be the positive? Do you want to be the person that brings people up? Or do you want to be the catty person that gets online and says bold things because you're not face to face? That tear down and not make people stronger. Man, let's be the people that lift each other up. That we look at different people who are different than us, and we just love them. We don't judge them. We just love them. And we support and are there and strengthen. And ladies, I'm telling you, straight up, real talk, the greatest thing you can do is to support the people in your life. Support your teammates. Support your siblings. Go sit by the person who has no one sitting by them. Say hello, thank you, show appreciation. When you're checking out in line, don't be on your phone. Look at someone in the face and say, how are you, how's your day? You will change lives that way. So just love and let them know we love you. And it's not personal if someone else has an issue. It's not personal, that's their problem. That's their insecurity. So if someone comes with you at anything, I don't care what it is, and you're like, man, they're attacking me. No, it is their insecurity and their problem. It's not yours. And don't give them the power to allow it to become yours. So I'm going to pass it. And I think, you know, I want to say, you keep supporting them. Praise your wolf pack. This is the wolf pack. You praise your wolf pack. Nobody gets in. Of it. Great job. Awesome. I'm fired up now. Uh, <laughs> Let's go play. Let's go. One on one. So, uh, cultural obstacles. Um, I coach female sports uh, at Southeast School here in Bakersfield. I've coached male sports as well. I enjoy it. It's a culture for me as well. Uh, one of the cultural obstacles I deal with is what are you going to do with that in college? You just need to go to the university. What, what are you going to do with softball? What are you going to do with volleyball? That's not going to get you anywhere. Um, my advice is competitiveness. Uh, it's going to teach you to be competitive in your life for the rest of your life. Uh, any, any feelings on that and how you battle these cultural obstacles where the family, the, the family comes to you with no value of athletics? They play athletics in high school as more of a social activity for them and not a career or a future. We may not all get to the WNBA, but we could be competitive in the grocery line. We could take our business uh, where we need to take our business to, but it all comes from the experiences you gather throughout your young life. Um, any advice on that and how you battle that? I would say that's why we have coaches. Because my coach inspired me. Because I had a principal that told me to go sell oranges on the freeway. Oh yeah. Real deep, deep, for real, for real, right? And I had a family that just talked about get a, get a job. You don't need to play sports. Look where I'm at now. I'm next to the goat. If I wouldn't have played sports, where would I be? The goat. <laughs> so coaches are so important. 
Because no matter what's going on in that household, they're telling them sport is no good, no good. You're showing them a whole different avenue and an opportunity. So now you are giving them a choice. And then you're giving them a voice. And it might not be the voice that their family wants to hear. My family didn't want to hear it. And when I got there, oh, that's, look at our daughter. Look where she's at. And I'm like, oh, good Lord. Right? But you make them proud. But a coach is very, very instrumental in that. Mom, you, guys, you guys are the coaches, but keep doing what you're doing, sir. Please. Please. Because they need your strength. And there are a lot of young ladies who don't have a father figure. So step in and, and be that person for them. And continue to open your mouth. Outstanding question. And real quick, just as an athlete, I'm just going to echo what they said. Having a coach in your life who believes in you and says, no, like, no matter what you're hearing from the outside, like, in this bubble, we believe in you and we know that we are going to support you. I mean, I have my elementary coaches. Uh, we went to the playoffs this year, and I have one of my elementary coaches in the crowd, and if that was not the most special moment, don't ever underestimate the impact that a coach can have when you say, no, you can make a future out of this, and it does not have to be and the WNBA, whether you're an athletic director, whether you're a coach, or whether you just take the life skills that you learn, hearing that from someone time and time again, there's there's no value that you can just put on that. Thank you. Any other questions? So, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I tell you right now, Paula had that going south. I know. I told my acuity shooting a hook shot. Had that going south. Okay, this is awkward now. I'm not sure. So, um, not necessarily right now, but last season I had a coach that, not last season, it was two seasons ago. I had a coach two seasons ago that told me that um, basically that I had an attitude problem. No, I, I don't have an attitude, I swear. But, <laughs> hold up, hold up. Everybody, oh, look. Let's see, that table over there, y'all, just hold on. You're like, yeah, right, girl. <laughs> yeah, you do. But, like, she was, she kicked me out of the gym a couple times, and it's just, and at the end of the season, I ended up quitting because she ended up telling me that she didn't believe I could be anything good. And honestly, I'm not really anything that good. I play volleyball. I plan on going here next year, but, um... That's an awesome choice. <laughs> uh, anyways, I just wanted to see how you would deal with the coach that tells you you aren't anything. And, yeah, I don't really know what I'm asking, but... Coaches that tell you you no, are getting you need to take this, coach, because I might hurt that poor child to you. <laughs> well, no, in, a, in a good way. In a good no, way. No, I, no, 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 I'm going to ask you a question. Honestly. Honestly. You said that you don't have an attitude. Do you think that you might have been overly sensitive? Yes or no? Do you, yes or no? Do you feel that sometimes you may have got caught up in your feelings? Simply yes or no. Yeah, I used to. And okay, no, no, no. Please, please, my dad for past tense, present tense. Just simply, did you, did you have one? Sometimes, did you have an attitude? Honestly. And it wasn't because of what you were anticipating that your coach would say or do. Did you try to like have a sit down with her or him? Was it her or him? Her. Did you ever try to sit down with her and say, Coach, there's something between us. I feel it. I know I'm getting that from you. What's making you feel this way? I tried, yeah. And uh, my mom was with me because it was. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I was, it was 16 at the time. So I was 15 on the 16th team. So I had my mom with me, and then she ended up going after my mom about how. I was my mom's problem, and it wasn't a problem anymore. She actually said that to you? Yeah. Oh, wow. My mom talked, it was something about how, like, I had a migraine at practice one day, and she got mad at me, and my mom, she told my mom, she's, we're not talking about you, we're talking about Stevie right now. And she's blatantly disrespected my mom. So, she was just not a very good coach, and she talked down to a lot of the other players, and she ended up without a team at the end of the season. Uh, so what's your question? She's gone. You're here. <laughs> just like how to deal with a coach that is. No, my my thing is is you know what? If she is what, what you're describing, okay, because she's not here to defend herself, okay. 
But with that being said, have it played out the way that you're saying, you've moved on. And in the future, before you start casting blame and laying it at someone else's doorstep, be bold enough, brave enough, and honest enough to do some self-evaluation. What am I bringing to this situation? What am I bringing into, in, into these circumstances? What's my part in this? And once you figure that out, and it's still an issue, sit down. But a lot of times it's going to play its way out, but you have to remain positive. You have to remain focused. It's your goal, your life, go after it. Not everybody's going to pat you on your back. It's going to be more like this. Not <laughs> this. Or show you the door. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. Sit down. <laughs> Great question. All right. Last question. As lunch is ready. Days you just don't want to be there, but like, what would you recommend for other people? Who don't and you're the wrestling team? Yes. You wrestle? Yes, ma'am. I would grab somebody right now, body slam my teammates, <laughs> break them over, and you're the wrestling team! <laughs> Come on now! I mean, if you're not motivated and you step in on the wrestling team on the mat, It's more your actions that ins are, are more inspiring than words. Actions speaks louder than words. Okay, well thank you. Because I've been like on other sports teams in the past, and oh, it's really frustrating to play with a team that doesn't want to be there. So that was more so coming from that like branch of sporting. But you know what? It's a life experience. I mean, it was great over here. It's a challenge over here. You're learning. Not everything's going to be smooth sailing. You have to be adaptable. And you can't save everybody, and you can't encourage everybody. Okay. And you can take care of yourself and do what you're told by your coaches. And that's because you can't some days take breaks and then yell at your teammates to get fired up. Because they would look at you and say, well, you didn't do it on Tuesday, but now all of a sudden you want to do it on Thursday. If you want to inspire people and be a leader, you do it Monday through Sunday. Because when I led my team, oh, they were moving. They were getting beat up. I know we can't do them. There's big bees in the room. Back in the day, you give them a little nudge, but you have to be the example. You have to do it Monday through Sunday. You can't choose to take days off. That's how you lead a team. Okay? Thank you. Last words? I'm good. So, so thank you very much, because this has been enlightening for me. Uh, pay it forward, young ladies. And moms and dads and coaches show them how to pay it forward. And as best as you can, try not to be discouraged. You're your best children. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Coach, thank you so much, Coach. Show by the rest of the shirt. Coach. Uh, lunch is served. Yeah.
Thank you. Um, it's probably all, like, I'm on a diet, I probably can't eat anything over there anymore. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll, just, I'll, I'll hit it up. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll hit it up. <laughs> Thank you. 
ser possível. And the next one, we've talked, you, you've met the greatest out of Kern County with women's basketball. Now you're going to get the opportunity to meet the greatest out of Kern County in women's softball. UCLA Hall of Famer, College World Series MVP. Ow. Representing the United States, gold medalist in softball and um, Centennial High School grad, North High School teacher, Woo! math instructor. Coached at Oregon, coached at UCLA, UC Riverside, the one, the only, Megan Langenfield. And then, because of this rain, we've been really blessed to have the softball team here. And since the whole thing we've done has been a little bit off script, I would like to introduce and have come up another Hall of Famer, our great current softball coach, Casey Good. almost five years older than me, so I wanted to be a lot, a lot like her. So that was something I watched my older sister play soccer. Um, but if you want to talk about growing up tough, I have an identical twin sister. So if, if a brothers help you, but having someone who looks exactly like you and does everything with you creates this competitive nature that I feel is really, you know, it's something they really hold on to and, and kind of help me grow into sports and us be able to have like a safe competition to take it out on one another. Yeah, and you talk about competition. I've known them for a long time. It is real. Megan, what got you into softball? Um, honestly, my parents uh, answered or saw an advertisement in the Bakersfield Californian advertising for BASA, for the Bakersfield Amateur Softball Association. And I must have been probably about maybe about six or seven years old, and I said I wanted to try it, and it, the rest is history. Basically, answered an ad. That's awesome. <laughs> Casey, what do you got? You, so, so Casey actually has a handwritten letter for me when I tried to recruit her to come play for me to play basketball. So she was a phenomenal athlete because she would have done wonders for us in basketball. So what got you into sports, Casey? I was bored at home. Like, I probably just like every other daughter, you know, right? You, not a lot of opportunities, like, growing up and, um, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have face again. I'm aging myself again. But we had um, NOR, we played NOR rec, and um, my first coach was my mom, and that was, a disaster. <laughs> uh, for those of you that have ever played for your parents, and um, I don't think it's probably taken some from her dad, uh, not good, not a fun time. And, um, you know, I think it just kind of um, ingrained in me that I had to find something to do because, um, you know, playing roller play hockey in the streets um, was not going to get me anywhere. So. I was better at softball, I thought, than, than basketball. I always thought I was too short to play basketball, so I, I went the softball route. She was good enough to play basketball. 
And then he just studied me straight up. And it just kind of made me happy that she found that notebook, which is really cool. So um, one of the things that we kind of talked about is, is this whole concept that so often when we get on the field, you know, and Cheryl talked about it, and Nikki talked about it, you know, not being soft. We don't want to be, we don't want to be the carrot. We don't want to be all hard and not coachable and resistant like the egg, but we want to be like the coffee bean, okay? And so one of the things that I've talked about with my players and help them understand, try to help them understand, is this idea of an alter ego. That when you step on the floor, that you are not, that I'm not coach, I'm not Paula, that I'm now coach y'all. And, and so Megan, tell us about a little about your persona when you step on to the field. It's almost like a switch goes off. Like I am Megan or Miss Langenfeld for any of my former students out in the stands. Um, it is a totally different person as soon as I step across the white line. Um, I do have a physical kind of cue. Um, I guess one physical and one is a, a nickname. Um, the physical is my visor. Um, the, in the slideshow, there's a picture of my one of my UCLA visors, and it is dirty. Like, it is disgusting. Um, but as soon as I put that visor on, the switch is on. Like, I am not a nice person when the switch is on. Not a nice person. Um, the other kind of cue that I had uh, was actually my name. My teammates told me that Megan was not intimidating enough, and so I had to have a more intimidating nickname. So they shortened my last name, so I was lame forever. Um, in travel ball when I was younger, in college is where it became um, more prevalent. Um, Coach Lang, that's how I, my players referred to me. So it was Lang, and then the visor was always a constant. But yeah, my alter ego is not a nice person. So yeah, I love that. <laughs> Tara. Yeah, mine was more of I really identified with my jersey number. And so I had this goal that when I was on the field during games, that the other coach had to be screaming my number at least twice before half. Um, the other girls had me, who's marking five? I, I had to be a problem. So at the end of the game, when we're going through the high five line, the coach would be like, hey, great job, number five. And that was a job, that was like a goal of mine every game. And when I got the good job five, I ended up my, my, my goal that day. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, Casey, what about you? What, what, what do you do when you were a competitor? What did you do to get yourself on the field to get who you wanted to be? Well, uh, since we're trying to educate young athletes, I will be completely transparent and say I was probably one of the um, more talented athletes, but I didn't have the drive and the, the desire to absolutely be the best. And I don't know if it was because like I did just enough to get by or if it was because I was successful, but what I've learned now is I want my players now to be what I should have been. So, you know, I'm constantly on them. I, I don't really, I mean, I sometimes give like examples of, you know, things that happened when I was in college or something, but we, that was so long ago, but just something to, you know, um, that they can relate to, that maybe they've gone through. Um, and and I just try to push them to, to be what I wasn't, because I think I did a disservice to, you know, to sports sometimes. And, um, it's, it's enjoyable for me to see um, young females, you know, break through ceilings and, and crush their goals. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, um, Megan, we talked earlier, you talked about some light bulb moments in your life. Let's talk about those. Yeah, um, I think we've all hopefully at some point within our athletic journey have come across what I call a light bulb moment. And it could be, it's any sport. And what I'm talking about is the moment where something makes sense. It could be a shot, it could, in terms of basketball, it could be learning how to do something on the soccer field, um, learning a new pitch, um, and you grow through that grind and that frustration time period when the light bulb finally turns on. Um, it takes a lot of perseverance and it takes a lot of um, mental toughness 
to continue to show up every day, even though knowing that you're working on something that's a struggle. Um, so I attribute my athletic success to two light bulb moments. Um, and it's funny because I know exactly where I was, how old I was, the time of day, like when the light bulb went on. Um, one of them was when I learned how to throw my changeup because the changeup in softball, for all the softball athletes, the changeup is so important, it's, it, there's no words to it. Um, and I was probably maybe about nine or 10 years old out at Besa at the fields. I still remember where I was, my dad was catching me and suddenly the changeup became consistent. I'm like, holy crap, like the light bulb went on. Like there it is, there's the aha moment. Um, and then the second one is when hitting became easier. Um, where, again, softball terminology, um, I was learning how to stick to an approach of what to look for, what to hunt, um, in regards to what pitches I wanted to hit, and then suddenly hitting became a uh, single to left, a double to right, and then a home run to center. It was like crazy. And again, you know exactly where I was. I was in Corona, California, at Butterfield Park, playing at an 8 a.m. game. Like it was kind of crazy how much that light bulb moment can really make an impact on you as an athlete, but also going forward in your athletic career. That's awesome. A game-winning home run of national championship game. That, that, that too. That so, too. so, so tell us about that. So Sandy, tell us about that World Series, you know, beating Arizona. Arizona. Yes. I grew up in Tucson. Bear down. Uh, so the the home run, so it's so fascinating how the game knows, right? The game knows. We talk about whether whatever game you're talking about, whether it's soccer, basketball, softball, tennis, golf, it doesn't matter. The game knows. The game knows who's putting in the preparation and who is making the the mental aspect and the mental reps just as important as the physical. So I'll say that as kind of a prelude. In the when was it? In the top of the seventh, I was pitching, and I had given up not one, but two home runs to have Arizona go up. Um, I think it was either, I think, five to four. And so um, I felt like the ultimate loser, like the ultimate loser. I finally get pulled. Thank God I need to get pulled. Um, I go, I get my first base and spin. I go over to first base. And I am, this is how mentally not there I was. I was in my head, as the game is literally going on, I was mentally preparing for the post-game conference, for the post-game interviews of, Megan, how did it feel to give up two home runs in the top of seven? I was mentally prepared of how I'm gonna answer that question. So we get out of the inning, we come in the dugout, and we tie it up in the bottom of the seven. So in the top of the eight, Arizona doesn't do anything, it's still tied. And I'm scheduled to hit third, I believe, in that inning. And I had two of my teammates come up to me and say, Lang, you know we're going to win this game, right? And they looked me dead in the eye in all seriousness to where I'm like, okay, yeah, we're going to win this game. Like, I, they forced me to believe in something that hadn't already happened. And so... Um, that's sure enough, I got into the batter's box and I had done this mental preparation of visualizing success so many times since the time I was 13. Preparing, mentally preparing for this moment. And um, I remember the first pitch came in and it, I felt like the ball was floating. Like it was so, such a slow motion where I'm like, oh wow, this has potential. To be, yeah, this has really good potential. And then the second pitch, the count was one to know the second pitch, it, the ball went out. And it was our right off the bat, you knew it. It was the, way out. It was, it was dead center. It was, it was pretty cool. That's for the national championships. And MVP, give it up. That's huge. <laughs> you know, Megan, the thing I love most about that, and I think it's just all about life. You know, I can't even imagine giving up those two runs, and I appreciate you talking about the mental checkout after that. You know, how we go into protection mode. And, and I know for me personally, with all sorts of parts of my life, I get nailed and I'm at my lowest level. And if I'm just patient, 
It's not too far away that that big high comes. And, and it's the whole idea of, and what great things your teammates, and I love how you talked about how you went there before in your mind since you were 13 year old. I mean, how many of you are there basketball players? I hope you're on the free throw line. Free throws are a travesty in our sport right now. Get on that free throw line, put yourself at the end of the game. You know, score tie, down by two, whatever. Put yourself in that situation. For those of you who are volleyball players, you know, the serve, softball players, making the catch, getting the hit, wrestling's, getting the pin. Put yourself over and over again in your mind. So in talking about that, Taryn, how many of you in here have dealt with injuries? Anybody? Okay. Now, a lot of times people will get injured and might have an ACL tear. Some people get injured and have a second ACL tear. Others will get injured and have a third ACL tear. And then they have a twin sister that does the same exact thing. So six total. Major shout out to Terry's uh, mom, Terry. She's going to hate me for this. She's like, man. I got Dr. Hamlin on speed dial on his personal phone, which is true. MRIs that day, and then major shoulder issue when you play here at BC. So you had all of this stuff happen either prior to and being at Bakersfield College, but yet you went on and finished finish your career. How, what does that look like? How does that happen? It's it's funny because I was talking to Tori about this because I feel I deal that with my athletes all the time. When I have one pair of ACL and she's done. And I'm like, come back. You know, like, come on, this isn't a season, I mean, it's a season injury, right? You're, you're done with your season, but you don't have to be done with your career. Um, and it was funny, I was talking to my sister about that. She's like, you just hated being told no. Like, you just took that as a challenge. Like, anytime anyone ever said no to me, I was like, oh, wait. Let's see how this is going to turn out. Um, but really, I think there was always an end goal inside for me. Um, there wasn't really women's professional soccer going on at my age. And so I knew that college was always my dream. I wanted to get to college soccer. And so I tore my ACL my first time when I was 13, tore it again my junior year at the end of club season, and then my senior season right at the beginning of it. And so I wasn't getting the college offers, you know, Paula's over here like, hey, check out BC, you know. And luckily, Scott Dameron, who was the coach at the time, was great. Um, yeah, I just wasn't done. I wasn't ready to hang up my cleats yet. I was like, I haven't even got to where I wanted to go. I really wanted to play college soccer. And I had to redefine my dream a little bit and to include community college soccer because that wasn't where I wanted to go. I wanted to go deep one. I wanted to go play for North Carolina. Like, I had these big goals. I wasn't going there, but um, I wanted to continue to play. So luckily, I had a great support system. Luckily, I had a doctor. And luckily, I had people who told me no. And I said, you just sit back and you watch me go and, and go and do it. And, I didn't end up being one, I ended up here, and I ended up going and transferring to Division Two. but I still got to play and still got to have some fun with the sport that I'm very passionate about. And that is what you call strength, ladies. That is what you call strength. That's what you call determination. That is what you call not letting anything stand in your way. That if it's a goal, you're going to find a way. And that's just one of the things I've always loved about you and about your sister. So, talking about community college, talking about four-year, Coach, Coach Casey, you went four-year, now you coach at the community college level. What, what would you say to these, these future athletes with regard to those types of decisions? Don't count out the community colleges. Um, you know, so I started my career at a, a junior college in Louisiana. I went to school in Louisiana, um, was a lot like you know, um, these women up here, I wanted to go D1, and there was nothing that was gonna stand in my way. Um, and at the time, like, I wanted to get away from home. So I, I got a scholarship um, in Louisiana, and once I graduated, um, coaching was really the only option. I didn't know absolutely what else on earth I was gonna do. Um, and took a two-year um, job at LSU Eunice, who was a brand new program, and, and started it from the ground up, and, and fell in love with um, the two-year program. I like to say it's because I'm a commitment phobe at the four-year school, but um, you know, two years um, to me was plenty of time to really impact um, the student athletes before they moved on to a higher level. 
And um, I, I think that it's important that, you know, that our athletes at this level have somebody that can, then can mentor them and prepare them as best as we can to move them on to the four-year schools because, you know, like Cheryl said earlier and like Nikki said, like it, it's not easy once they move on. You know, we, I tell our athletes all the time, you guys have no idea how easy it is here. And not to discredit the resources we have at BC because they're phenomenal. But at the next level, they're gonna want more. And they're gonna want more time. And they're gonna want more commitment. And um, sometimes students at this level aren't, they're not prepared for that. And for whatever reason that is. So, you know, the two, two year level is really stuck with me. I went to a four year level, you know, I went, I went and I took a head coaching job at another one in Louisiana, the four year level, and um, I hated it. it I, I did not like, I didn't like it. I, I found more um, desire and drive from the kids that go to a two year school because sometimes the two year school is their only option. You know, we, if you look at our roster this year, we've got kids that, are, are really, really good. And we got stuck in COVID. And so these kids didn't have anywhere to go. They got overlooked. They didn't get a senior year. And, um, you know, so I, I brought a lot of them in and I said, you guys, like, this is a, this is a launching pad. It's, it's not the end of the world that you're here. It's not um, embarrassing that you're here. This is somewhere that you can come, you can get better, and you can move on to a four-year school and you can get your degree. And that's that's our goal with BC Softball here is, is getting these kids an education, bettering them as people, and then moving them on to a four-year school. You know, I, I'm not I'm not going to lose sleep if I never win a state championship because I know at the end of the day, um, the women that we are producing out of BC Softball are going to be great women of the community and they're going to represent in everything that they do. So they're, they're to be commended. The two year programs are, are just as competitive and if not way more desire and drive because they're, they're fighting for something. Preach coach, preach. You know, I only had sites for D1. I was going D1, I was going to get a full ride scholarship D1 and that's exactly what I did. And I passed up the greatest opportunity I could have played at the community college that wanted me in California. Central Community College to play for Lynn Larson, one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time. I didn't even realize she played for a national championship the year before. But my ego was so set on D1 that it did not better my career. And I, I, I wish I would have gone to the community college. But I am grateful that I understand that now. And so, so many of us have these goals and we think, oh, I have to come to BC. Are you kidding? This is one of the greatest colleges in the nation. Not just in the state. Several years ago, we were ranked number two in the nation and number one in California. This is a legit option with people who are passionate about you, class sizes, professors that are all in for your success. So this is a great choice, okay? I had to give our little plug. Whether, you know, and, and we, you saw, you've seen a lot of people at the community college. So, Taryn, we've talked a little bit, um, you know, with coaching, and what are some of the things that you do with your team to help them flip the switch when they get on the field? Yeah, unfortunately, I love that you get to have, like, a physical advisor. I wish we had advisors that would take care of, like, headers, headers, but anyway, sun protection. Um, but what we do is our, our field is – that's when we step on the field, that's when we're playing. So when we, um, we, it's that barrier, okay? And so my team's not allowed to stretch on the field. We stretch on the track or we stretch behind the goal because when you step on the field, you're working. Um, so that way when they're, we can't cut across the, the grass to go to class, you have to walk all the way around the track. And sometimes at the beginning of the season, girls are complaining. Um, but that way they know that as soon as they step on, even if they're not feeling great that day, they have that, oh, I'm crossing that barrier, I'm crossing that line to get on the field, and now it's time to work. It's time to put aside whatever's going through that day, whatever class is going on, whatever work is going on, any family issues, um, and they're able to kind of show up for the, uh, the sport and for that training that day, and if you get the whole team committed about it, uh, we get some great trainings in before a game. That's awesome. 
she talked about that, and I'm like, oh, I gotta make this change, and I gotta make this change, and I gotta make this change, which I think is, that's what I love, is to always be learning and growing. Megan, as you coach athletes, what are some of the things you want to instill in them? I'm a good question. Um, I think some of the things that I want to make sure, I guess it depends on their age. So for the younger athlete, by younger, I mean younger than high school. So um, starting as young as elementary school and junior high. One thing that I, I think is happening a little bit too much right now is um, over-specialization. Um, specifically when discussing or talking about one athlete or one female athlete only playing one sport for their entire athletic career. I think that's a travesty. Um, I think, especially for the young athlete, play all the sports. You really have no idea what you might be passionate about unless you try it. Um, so play volleyball, basketball, softball, if those are the three you want to do. Play, um, gosh, I think golf, basketball and track and field. Um, but play as much as you can. That way you actually have an idea of what you might be passionate about. Um, that's one. Um, number two, as the, the athlete gets a little older, they might find something that they're actually truly passionate about. Um, I would say, especially for this day and age where cell phones and TikTok and social media are the thing, um, that I was taught one, I guess, life lesson. You can be an All-American in two things. It's your choice on which, which two you want to be an All-American in. You can be an All-American in your sport, you can be an All-American in your school, or you can be an All-American in your social life. There's no right or wrong answer, it's your ultimate choice. So for me personally, I decided to choose school and softball. Um, I had teammates that decided to be softball and social. And school was a little bit more of a struggle. And it's not that they're right or wrong, it's just their, their choice. Um, so I would say, again, for the younger, play everything. For the older, pick what two aspects you want to be an All-American in. And I absolutely love that, because that's the reality. We want to do all things, and it's, you just can't. There's not enough time. Um, Casey, you talked a little bit about social media, TikTok, all that stuff. You know, what advice do you give as people are, you know, marketing themselves and, and doing all of these things? You know, what are some do's and don'ts? What are things that might concern you as a coach and all that? Well, since we were talking about social media, one of the biggest things that I think young student athletes should know is what you post on social media will always be there. Um, I couldn't even tell you how many coaches we could sit here and list right now that probably go through their social media when they're recruiting uh, athletes. Even, I mean, obviously, probably at Oregon, UCLA, they, you know, they've got the manpower to do that. But even at our level, um, I have no problem going, if I get an email from a student that wants to play softball here at BC, one of the first things I do is figure out how to find them on social media, because I'm a little slow on that stuff too. Um, but I go and see what they post. You know, I think um, what young females post about, um, what they say, uh, things they retweet, um, all of that stuff has an impact. And I don't think sometimes we really realize it. I know, like, my day and age, we didn't have social media, right? And we were talking at our table, if we had social media back then, maybe, some, maybe we wouldn't be sitting up here. I don't know. Like, you know, I mean, times have changed. But it's important to, to really represent yourself as a, as a strong athlete, a female who, who will hold your ground and, and be proud of the choices that you make because I, I can attest to it, a social media post can be the yes of a letter of intent or a no, real fast. That is so true. I was actually going to tease and say, I, some of you are probably going through withdrawals right now that you haven't been around from your phone, but then as I worked around the room, there's still some who can't give up their phone. And, 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 and that's just sad. You know, the importance of just being present and being in the moment. I remember one time I I'm at dinner with my brother and sister-in-law, and they're on the phone the whole entire time. And I traveled to Phoenix to see them. So I called my brother on the phone. Just sitting right there. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I came here to see you. I obviously don't want to get your attention. It's on the phone. 
Be present with who you're with. I don't want to do anything to build about this whole concept of how many likes I'm going to have and how that is this false sense of who we are and the impact it has on athletes. Yeah, it's, a, it's a good question. I think it hits us more being females too because we're so caught up in sometimes how we look, right? There was questions like how can I be keep my feminine touch while being a, a shot put? Um, so I think when we just start really tying our identity into what other people are seeing us, we're not really representing who we are um, and not really taking into account what we can become. So instead of really focusing on the outside, focus on the inside so that when others are saying things about you, we can brush it off. Like Paul said, don't give them that power, right? Um, have the power yourself so things don't hit you as hard as they might to others. Megan, you got anything? I don't, it's hard. It's, it's hard because it's, I don't want to say soul sucking, but you, it's a trap. Like you end up just scrolling to scroll and then you kind of think to yourself, why in the hell am I scrolling? Like, what is the purpose? Um, so I would recommend if you're that person that, that likes social media and likes to have the likes and, and the, the loves, the hearts, the comments and everything, um, I would say set yourself a timer. Like, I'm only going to do this for a half hour at a time. I mean, that sounds crazy. Like, we can watch an episode of Friends in a half hour. You know what I mean? Like, um, so if you're that person, set yourself a timer. Okay, if you're the one that wants to be the influencer, right? Because like, that is, I asked my students one day what they want to be when they grow up. And I am not kidding. I had one student <laughs> who is currently failing his class. He said... <laughs> He wants to be an influencer on YouTube. And I'm like, oh, I, you realize you have to be passionate about something to be an influencer about that, right? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, it's not going anywhere. I'm moving to the next subject. <laughs> like, so you know the two, but yeah. Anyways, um, so if you if you do want to be that influencer, pick something that you're passionate about, and again, be an all American. That doesn't mean that you're going to search for the likes. Search for the impact that you can have on a life. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, when I look at social media, what are we posting? And I challenge us to post things that help people become better. I challenge us to post things that make people stronger. Um, our baseball coach just retired, Tim Payton. He talked about his daughter who played volleyball at the University of Arizona. And she wasn't on social media at all. And their team had problems because of stuff that was happening on social media between teammates and everything else. But she didn't have an issue with any player on her team. She got along with every single one of them. Because she wasn't on social media at all. You know, we don't recognize, when you talk about a soul sucker, and we talk about a self-esteem sucker, and just everything that shows us less than I. I had an interesting experience. I was um, at a basketball game recruiting, and I was talking to a friend of mine and um, their daughter who's in seventh grade. And she's in the club scene and all of that, and was talking about these other players she's about ready to compete against, you know, and their social media presence. And she was already intimidated to go compete against someone that she hadn't even seen in person because of their social media presence. I don't know, how many of you show your worst side on social media? How many of you are doing your ball handling drills on social media and you do the ones that go bouncing off your foot? No, it's how many takes? How many takes? How many takes? How many takes? And yet we want to compare ourselves our worst to their best. Don't let people have power over you like that. Realize that they are showing you the very, very best. That's why I'm not on social media as much anymore. Because I realize I post something, I want to see what people's feedback was. And that's not what it's all about. It's how can we impact people? How can we build people? Um, she's right. No, I, I just I just really go back to the 
you know, to the two being at a two year college and the impact that we can have on um, these athletes really as they get started into their their um, college careers. You know, it's 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 important, and I think it's important for female athletes to have other females that they can look up to, and and you know, like Nikki said, and and Cheryl said, and the AD said, it. Networking is important, and women have to build women up. We've been saying that for, for months now, right? Years. Um, but, you know, it's Women's History Month, right? We, we should be building women up and not tearing each other down. And we find that a lot in women's athletics. We find a lot of times that females don't know how to, to turn the, the competitive switch off. And so I hate her on the field, and I hate her off the field. And, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with women going out and just completely going at it, but I think that, um, you know, it's a lot about respecting the game and the game doesn't know. I know that's a rude thing. I, I follow it on social media, you know, um, and I think that's important because our, I keep talking about our kids because I love this team. I, 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 this is one of my favorite teams I've had. We have 13 kids, you guys. It's not a lot, okay? But let me tell you something. They're, they work hard. They enjoy being at BC. They're proud to wear BC across their chest. Um, I don't think a single one of those kids thinks I shouldn't be there. You know, I, I think all we want is an opportunity. That's what we've been talking about. And any kind of opportunity we can get, any kind of foot in the door that we can get, um, it doesn't matter. And if we have to start at the bottom, then we start at the bottom, right? I, when I started my coaching careers in, I don't know, 2005 or something, I started for Ten thousand dollars a year, and an on-campus dorm. That was it. Um, I think it, it equated to like eight hundred dollars a month. And I'm thinking, how in the world am I going to live off eight hundred dollars a month and like survive? Um, well, I just put everything into coaching because I didn't have money to do anything else, you know. And took another opportunity for for better pay. Was it the, the right choice? Probably not, because I thought. I'm a female, I need to get a job where I can make money. And it didn't make me happy, and I went back to the two-year school and I found my niche. Um, coming to BC, you know, I'm originally from here, North High grad, yeah, North High grad, okay. Um, I was proud, I'm proud to be from Bakersfield, and I'm proud to be at, at BC as the head softball coach because this is where I'm from. This is where Megan's from. I mean, I honestly, you guys, I never thought we'd see Megan Langenfield at North High. <laughs> As a math teacher and not, not like coaching the team, right? I was probably the first one when I found out she was coming back to North, like she was moving back. I hit her up on social media in the DMs, okay? And I said, hey, Megan, we need a, a pitching coach. Are you interested? She's like, no, I'm good. Like she, she wanted to get back and get her feet wet in, in, in you know, teaching and, and Good for that, you know, that's that's awesome. She's still able to impact people in a way that um, is is going to, you know, change some of your lives. And and I think it's important. It doesn't necessarily have to be on a field. Uh, it could be a teacher. It could be a counselor. It could be whoever. Um, as long as you have a, a good support system, you know, I think maybe a lot of a lot of us are, are lucky to have the support system, you know, that we do and, and we, we just need to keep building women up. Keep building them up. Keep keep going. Anything real quick from either one of you that you'd like to? Any final? I think something that I'm always talk, uh, talking to my athletes about is if A isn't working, there's still B, C, D, and E, right? And if B, C, D are closed, there's you know tons of letters in the alphabet we can keep going through. Um, and I think that's what I love about soccer. It's I get to coach them, right? I get to teach them what I want to teach them, but game day, I'm only shouting directions and guidelines, right? And they're the ones making decisions on the field. They're the ones, you know, whether or not they're passing it back to the keeper or they're going to go along. Um, and so if things don't go right away, right? Like she was talking about, like, make that phone call. She was getting that pizza. Oh, I'm so they hung up on her, right? She called again. So don't give up just because it doesn't work the first time, right? Just because, you know, things were close for me. I wasn't done. I wanted to keep going. Um, look for those other directions, look for those other gaps, and when you see those gaps, go at them 100% and see what happens. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, ladies. We really appreciate it.
And now we have this incredible opportunity to um, hear about a great woman by the name of Patsy Meek and so Olivia, I believe, if you're around, if you want to come up and, uh, and Judy, that would be fantastic. This is just so exciting. You talk about being in the grassroots. This is what it's all about right now. This is why all of us do. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, before we begin and do introductions, um, there is a video we would like to play, and then I will begin and have the honor of having a nice conversation with another fellow historian. So I hope you don't bore you, because we love history. We're going to geek out just for a minute. <laughs> so let's play the video. statutes on the books, 
about equality and opportunity for everyone, that girls and women were being left out systematically. And it was shut out of medical school and saved her daughter Gwendolyn experienced what she thought was the same gender discrimination when applying to college. Patsy led the charge to mandate gender equity. She co-authored Title IX of the Education Amendment of 1972, a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in any educational institution receiving federal funds. I truly believe that it's Title IX that has really brought the focus, women's ability and sport and physical activities, but it's important to remember the Title IX is education-wide. It was not specifically designed only for sports, but truly in the sports events activity, we have seen the most spectacular results. And I'm really proud to have a part in it. Upon Patsy's death in 2002, Congress renamed Title IX the Patsy T. Make Equal Opportunity in Education Act. I'm very much what he feels what you endure as we are. And if you just accept and do nothing, then life goes on. But if you see it as a way for change, life doesn't have to be this unfair. Maybe not for me, I can't change the past, but I can certainly help somebody else in the future so they don't get go through what I can do. Patsy Nick served a total of 12 terms as a U.S. Congresswoman and became the first Asian American woman to seek the presidential nomination. This May, as we celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we would also like to recognize Kimberly Basford, founder of Making Waves Films. An Asian American herself, Kimberly is the producer of the award-winning documentary, Patsy Nick, ahead of the majority, and was able to produce the piece you just saw for us as well. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's been a wonderful event so far, um, celebrating 50 years of Title IX. My name is Olivia Garcia, and I am a professor of history here at Bakersfield College. And it's my honor to moderate this conversation centered around Patsy Takamoto Me. And we're going to talk um, to you about two wonderful individuals who put this book possible, which is also uh, available uh, where the shirts are if you're interested uh, in getting a copy. And I'm sure some, some will be willing to do autographs. Which leads me to introduce you. I'm honored to introduce you to two individuals who played a key role. Um, we have J Judy. Chu Jen Wu, and Judy is a professor of Asian American Studies at the University of California at Irvine. She um, serves also as a director of UC Irvine's Humanity Center, and she has a PhD in U.S. History from Stanford University, and she's pre previously taught at the Ohio State University. Her previous books include Radicals on the Road, Internationalism, Orientalism, and Feminism During the Vietnam Era, as well as her first book, Dr. Mon Chung of the Fair Haired Bastards, which is a biography of Mar Margaret Jesse Chung, the first American born Chinese woman doctor. Judy Wu has won several awards for her work in academia, including the Chancellor's Award for an Excellence in Undergraduate Research Mentorship, and the Cross-Cultural Center Faculty Ally of the Year, and the 2021 Dynamic Woman of the UCI Award. So let's give a hand out to Judy. Also with us through video uh, is a very, another very important person to this conversation, and that's Gwendolyn Meek. Uh, she is the daughter um, of the late Congresswoman, and she was also a professor of politics at the UC Santa Cruz, and she also taught women and gender studies at Smith College. 
In the 1990s, Gwendolyn Mee chaired the steering committee of the Women's Committee of 100. It was a collection of academics, activists, and policy experts who advised members of Congress on welfare reform. Gwendolyn Meek has a doctorate in government from Cornell University, and she's currently an independent scholar writing about law and politics and gender in American society. And of course, you know, being the daughter of Patsy Takamoto Meek, it's obviously made a huge impact in her life and led her to this wonderful project. Together, her and Judy Wu have wrote the first biography of Patsy Meek, which is titled Fierce and Fearless. I love that title. Meek, of course, as you saw um, in the clip, represented the state of Hawaii in the House of Representatives from 1965 to 1977, and again from 1990 until her death in 2002. She's best known as an advocate for women and young girls, as well as for the author and defending Title IX, the legislation that we've been celebrating all day today, and which we know has given women and girls equal rights in education and school athletics. So also in recognition of her efforts, um, former President Barack Obama possibly awarded me with the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2014. So the book itself, Fierce and Fearless, tells the story of her life through first-hand anecdotes, vignettes, and photographs, giving readers an unprecedented understanding of the ideals and principles that fueled her mission in women's equality. So without further ado, I would love to move forward and have this conversation Judy, how did you begin working with Quinn to compose this awesome biography on Patsy Me? Thank you so much for your question, your introduction, and just the opportunity to be here. This has been so inspirational to have a picture taken with Cheryl Miller, to hear <laughs> stories from Nikki Blue, Megan Leganzel, and I just feel like I'm out of this world. Um, and actually, what is most impressive to me is how many high school athletes are here today. Um, yeah. I think this is really intergenerational feminist mentoring at its finest. I love the messages that are being conveyed about women supporting each other and um, to persevere despite doubts, um, despite hardships, even this, this, despite all the negative messaging and to really believe in yourselves. Um, I also want to thank my co-author. So she's here with me, not only on video, but through these bracelets. She had bracelets made with our name of the book, Fierce and Fearless, and we added feminist in there. So I always worry when I think about Wendy Mae. Um, I started looking for a book project in 2012, and the Library of Congress featured the papers of Patsy Mink. So as a historian, I love archives. And archives are materials from the historical time period. So these might be diaries, these might be letters, um, these might be newspaper clippings. But I get such a thrill when I can go in and look at somebody's writings from 50 years ago, 100 years ago. You really feel like you have a sense of connection with the person you're studying. The Library of Congress has Patsy Meek's papers. And I didn't realize at the time how many boxes they had. They have over 2,000 boxes of materials. Um, and all my books have taken 10 years to write, and that's how long it took to write a book about Patsy Meek. When I first started, everybody said, oh, you need to talk to her daughter, who was a political scientist and also a political collaborator. Um, Wendy lived just down the street from the Library of Congress, actually in the same condo that her parents lived in. So I would go do research about her family life, then I would go talk to her about her family life, and we would usually have dinner twice a week, you take Japanese food um, and then Chinese food. Um, but after we began talking and collaborating, I found out that her mother, Patsy, wanted Winnie to write her biography. And that's a really big responsibility to undertake to, you know, as a daughter to write your mother's biography. And Winnie actually felt a little bit stuck because she wasn't sure, should I refer to my mother as mom? Do I refer to her as me? What is my relationship to the person I'm writing about? 
And so because we decided to collaborate, it was easier for her to write these really beautiful mem memories, vignettes about her family, and then I could take the more um, kind of third-person approach in describing her mother. So um, when we actually pitched this book to some presses, they didn't like the idea that we were collaborating together. They wanted me to have be an independent scholar and to write her mother about it from a very objective point of view. But we really believed in our partnership and um, I think it's a really fitting work that we can be with each other, support each other in this writing project on someone who was such an advocate for feminist activism and feminist collaboration. Thank you. I should add that there's some no cards on your table in case you have any question during the presentation you want to ask her, please feel free to do that and there'll be someone picking them up towards the end as we wrap up. My next question is, can you describe the struggles that Patsy had to overcome as a Japanese American woman during and after World War II? How do you think those experiences inspired her to pursue a career in law and become a champion for all women of color? Thank you so much. Um, I think we've got a taste of that through the video. People often consider Patsy being sort of a pain in the ass <laughs> because she would not but always play the game. She wouldn't always play nice. She wouldn't always stay in the background. Um, when she helped to advocate for the Democratic Party, she was accepted as long as she was behind the scenes organizer. But when she decided she was going to run for office, the, the, the boys <laughs> who joined the party were saying, oh, we're not quite sure about that. Um, we don't sort of have her under our control. And she would say, well, if you had given me opportunities, I wouldn't be going into politics. Right? She wanted to be a doctor. And she was applying after World War II, where the returning veterans were receiving financial benefits from the US government, the GI Bill. And they were seen as the rightful owners of these educational opportunities, the rightful receivers of, of home loans. Um, and certainly, a country owes something to its veterans. But the people who were serving the military were all men at the time. And so for her to apply for medical school just as these men were coming back, there was very little opportunity for her to actually get into medical school. So even though she was a stellar student, she had all, all these extracurricular activities, none of the schools that would accept her. Um, she then decided she would go into law. She graduated from one of the strongest law schools in the country, the University of Chicago Law School. But when she graduated, she couldn't find a job. She was a woman, she was married, she was the mother of a young child. So she worked at the library, and she worked at the department store as a model, as someone who sold, sold clothes. Again, there just was not that opportunity. And then when she decided to go back to Hawaii to create her own law business, because there weren't opportunities, um, again, there were just closed doors. So she decided she's going to go to the politics. Right? If you can't, if you keep on facing closed doors, how do you open them, not just for yourself, but for many others? And I think that experience of being um, experiencing gender discrimination as well as racial discrimination really made her attuned to thinking about how to create opportunities for those who are most marginalized in our society. Which leads me to a, a question that ties with what you just said. How did her career in politics influence her legislative work in the House of Representatives? Yeah, she was someone who I describe as an intersectional legislationist. So I think many people have heard the term intersectional. And that's to think about gender oppression in relation to other forms of inequalities, whether it's race, sexuality, ability. Right? So how do you really understand how we experience our lives through the various forms of our identities and our bodies? Um, and because she was someone who had experienced discrimination as a woman, as someone who was non-white, as a mother, as someone who was very attuned to the plantation system that existed in Hawaii, which was very hierarchical, hierarchically organized, she had great sympathies with people who were workers, people who were poor. And so she really thought about different ways to design legislation that would enable those who are most excluded to feel that they have an opportunity, that they have an opportunity to engage in this society. And so that's where Title IX comes from. Title IX says if you receive federal money, then you cannot deny opportunity on the basis of sex. And as she was saying in the video, that, that legislation, even though it has had a profound impact on sports, 
It was really all elements of education. It was about admissions, scholarship, housing, um, you know, everything, you know, everything that you might experience within an educational institution, including concerns about sexual harassment. So I look around the room today and see so many young and older people who are engaged in the educational enterprise. That legislation, it provides the legal protection right, for, for women of different backgrounds to be able to experience educational opportunities on a more equal level. As with any legislation, it depends on the implementation. And so something that she talked about was that you have to be persistently vigilant because these opportunities can be taken away or people might try to skirt the intention of the legislation. And so it really takes our advocacy and our concern to make sure that these opportunities continue to exist. I'd like to ask you one more question before we go to another video showing when, but how did she inspire voters to support her at a time where the deck was against any woman, any woman? So what do you think? Yeah, so she uh, did not represent Honolulu, which is the capital of Hawaii, both the political capital and the financial capital. The district that she represented were these small towns, these rural areas, the outer islands of Hawaii. And not everybody in those areas necessarily um, aligned with her politically, but she really believed in constituent service. So I will find letters from a fourth grader saying, I'm doing a report on civics, will you send me some information? And she will do it. Um, I'm having my family members having a concern or an issue, will you help me advocate for them? And she will do that. Um, when I first started this project, I talked to the archivist who arranged the materials of passing these papers, and she said it was very noticeable how much of a personal impact she had on those materials. A lot of people had AIDS, and she also had AIDS. But she really took time to care for the people who voted for her. And so I just think it's such a beautiful um, idea that it's the people who are perhaps the furthest away from the continental United States, who are on the margins of the margins of the islands of Hawaii, that they're the ones who, who elected her to go to Congress, and that they wanted her to be a spokesperson for them. And with that, I want us to um, get to know when so we'll be sharing a video and where you'll get to meet her and she'll share a piece of the story so um the the years immediately leading up to what we know of as title nine were 1970 to 72. i started college in 1970. so um it wasn't so much growing up with that pro with the prospect of Title IX in the background. It was more kind of being part of the political frenzy to make sure that um, some kind of equity language was accomplished for women in the educational context. Um, and you know, so I was, I was a semi-adult, right, sort of a, an autonomous individual at that point, and that was. Um, exciting, but also um, very uh, distressing from time to time because the pushback against the idea of uh, fully equal rights for women in, in education is pretty powerful. Uh, people didn't want to, male institutions didn't want to share resources with women, uh, male athletics didn't want to share resources with women and so forth. So, to the extent that, that uh, educational equity um, was kind of window dressing, if they were okay with it, they you know, weren't going to make a big stink about it, but to the extent it had real world consequences um, because opportunity meant actually letting women in and uh, adapting the culture uh, to enable women to thrive and, and survive, that was not something that went over very um, easily. As a much younger child, um, education in general and educational equity were important issues to my mother, but there was no um, specific hook that she was working on during my you know, childhood, during my elementary school years and, and even high school years. Uh, the idea that a 
federal proclamation for equality for women in education was possible was not really in the uh, public imagination until the late 1960s. So when I was growing up, I would hear her lament at the uh, highly gendered and sexist socialization that I was subjected to in school. You know, and that became sort of ammunition in her, in her mind, as she was thinking about the increasing necessity of making changes in education. Many of the things that I was subjected to, she had been subjected to, as herself a student and an aspiring young professional or whatever. And I think it really, um, it really animated her to accomplish change because she couldn't stand the idea that the same roadblocks to full participation in life that had affected her were affecting the next generation. And so, you know, the, the uh, importance of um, making change so that the next generation would uh, have a better go of it was something that became really important to her. Yeah. So, Gwenda um, talks about those roadblocks and barriers. And so, it really, and of course, Pat's became the person who did. So, explain to me, like, her role in getting Title IX on this legislative agenda, and how did she become a champion? Yeah, I, I just want to emphasize something that Wendy said, which is that her mother saw her daughter having the same roadblocks. And actually, when Wendy applied to Stanford, Stanford said, you're highly qualified, but we met our quota for female students, so we're not accepting you. Right? At the time, it was much more blatant. Right? Now, it's a little bit more nebulous as to why someone might have, been, might have been rejected, but it was very overt. And the same thing was being told to Patsy Meek when she was applying to medical school. We're not accepting women. Um, so this is something that was part of a broader agenda that Patsy Meek had, which included federally funded childcare. Um, she had a very expansive vision of what it took to get to try to achieve gender equity. Um, but what I find most interesting is that not only did Patsonik advocate for the passage of Title IX, but she defended it. So when it initially was passed, it was part of an omnibus education bill. And actually, the athletic lobby wasn't really paying attention to Title IX. It was just part of an educational bill. But once it passed, all these schools and all these athletic interests started to take an interest, understanding that there were financial implications of what was in Title IX. And they spent about three years sending letters, sending lobbyists to Congress to dilute Title IX. Can you not take funding away from schools if they discriminate against women? Can private schools be exempt? Can certain sports be exempt? So this took about three years in which, once the bill is passed, there has to be some discussion about how it's actually implemented. And there was enormous pressure for Congress to walk back Title IX. And in fact, one of the crucial votes occurred um, I think it was in 1975. Um, Patsy was leading the charge, trying to defend Title IX, but she had to leave Congress that day because her daughter, Wendy Meek, was in a car accident. And there was no um, question in her mind what to priority. She had to go be a mother. And the, the aunties won by one vote, which would have been Patsy's vote. But because her allies understood what happened, they demanded a re-vote. And with that revote, they were able to defend Title IX. If anybody's interested in watching a fantastic documentary, a very short documentary about this particular episode, it's called Mink with an exclamation point. And it's done by Ben Proudfoot, who won the Academy Award um, last year for a best documentary. He did it on the Queen of Basketball, which is about a woman who played professional basketball, not in the WNBA, but in the NBA. Um, so again, take a look at that, um, Mink with an exclamation point. This is just one episode in which Title IX was attacked and defended. And that's why Patsy Mink, when she passed away in 2002, she was saying we need to continually be vigilant because these legislative gains are not there forever. They're only there as long as we defend those, um, those efforts. I love her passion. I wish I would have had an opportunity to get to know her. But I also love hearing um, what Lynn has to say. So why don't we look at another video um, and her sharing some additional insight.
One of the great things about Title IX after 50 years is that it opens so many doors and there is so much more opportunity for girls and women to participate in all walks of educational experiences, including um, most visibly athletics. But one of the depressing things after 50 years is that the same arguments that were made in the 1970s um, against Title IX are still around today and they crop up. And you know, depending on who's in power, there are pretty serious threats to the, the longevity of Title IX or, or at least Title IX with real teeth in it. Um, there were uh, rollbacks in Title IX enforcement under uh, the Bush administration in the early 2000s, and there was a redefinition of how Title IX was to be enforced under the Trump administration. And I have no doubt that if a, you know, another unfriendly administration comes into power, that Title IX will be um, front and center on the execution squad for many of those um, many of those folks um, who don't like the idea of the federal government being explicitly on the side of gender equity, right? So, um, so yes, it's at risk, and sometimes it's at risk because not enough girls and women know about it. You know, the only way Title IX is powerful is if girls and women use it and claim their rights under it and so forth. So if schools don't teach students that they have a Title IX right, then students will use their Title IX right and if they fall into disuse. So that's a, that's a danger. But um, beyond that, there's a need for constant vigilance because it's constantly under attack. Whether, you know, sometimes the attacks are very arcane they're very, um, they're very, uh, you know, sort of, they deal with minutiae in terms of what the implementation rules are. For example, how exactly to measure when schools have equitable athletics, right? That's not just a statement of, you know, having equitable athletics, it's actually about deciding how you gauge whether athletics are equitable and in the, interiors of, of those sorts of questions is where some of the most important decisions get made and they tend not to be transparent, right? They tend not to be visible to the, to the public. So um, people really need to pay attention. She raised some very valid points and we've heard it today, the conversation that you know, this legislation has been passed, you know, and, and you know, it's done. No, it's not. It's, it's the constant fight. What did you think about what she shared? Absolutely, I agree. People often ask me what I think Patsy Bean's legacy is, and certainly you can point to legislation um, in terms of her concerns about militarism, her protection about the environment, about feminist movements. But I what value most about Patsy Meek is that she was willing to fight. Um, the documentary that Kimberly Basford first produced was called Ahead of the Majority. And that comes from a quote when Patsy Meek ran for the US Senate in 1975-1976. So 1976 was the bicentennial of the United States, um, and our 250 is coming up. But that year, every woman who ran for the Senate lost. So what does that say about, to us about gender relations, right, in terms of the history of the United States? Um, but I love that phrase, ahead of the majority, because she said that it's easy to vote with the majority. It's easy to support something when it becomes popular. But it's so much harder to be that first person or the second person to say this is important and that we need to pay attention and that we need to support this because it's the right thing to do. And so I think of that as her legacy, that she's challenging all of us to be that, to be that brave, to, point, to do something that is difficult, um, but that we think is right. I have one more question, but first I'm going to open it up if there's anybody who had a, a note card that had a question. If you do, just wave it before we do have someone who can collect it. Just raise your hand. Oh, thank you. 
the easier. Okay. Title IX pertains to federally funded education programs. What advice would Patsy give us today for how to influence and change the private sector's attitude toward this and discrimination of women and girls? Um, well, uh, oh, thank you. I think everything that we want to change in this society is a mixture of policy and private action, right? Um, the law provides a certain mandate, a certain threshold of what we think is just in our society. And so that's very important. So um, I mentioned before Patsy being advocated for federally funded childcare because it shouldn't just depend on private resources or our local arrangements, whether there was adequate childcare and early childhood education for our, our youth. She really believed that there had to be quality um, educational opportunities for the very young to develop their minds, to develop who they are. And the way to do that was through federal resources. So on the one hand, that's very important, right? To have the policies in place, to have the resources in place. But what we're ultimately trying to do is actually change our hearts and minds. Right? How do we actually change the way that we relate to each other? Um, how do we change systemic inequalities so that we see them? and that we can try to move towards a more just society. Um, and I think what she tried to do was just talk about these issues. And she was not trying to bury them. A lot of our debates right now about what can or cannot be taught in schools, um, I think she would be a big advocate for exposing us to a range of ideas that really helps us understand this type of societal issues that we are facing. And that if we have a fuller range of discussions and debates, that we can hopefully collectively move towards something that will be, that will create a more just society. Um, so she is about changing policy, but I think she's also just about changing the way we think about our, our world around us. Were there any other note cards? So my final question is, we have lots of athletes in here, lots of female athletes. What do you think she would say to them? Well, Patsy was actually a very short woman, but I think she actually played basketball. <laughs> um, and she, if she really enjoyed hula, which is part of the Hawaiian dance tradition, um, she really believed in that boys and girls, women and men, should have the opportunity to fully develop themselves. So whether that's intellectually, physically, spiritually, socially, um, she was really about trying to figure out how can we become our full selves. Um, and I'm not a professional athlete or even a college athlete, but I, I really love sports. I love watching them. I love playing them. Um, I think it's really about um, kind of celebrating our human spirit um, and our capacity. So I'm, I'm so um, admirous of all these um, wonderful athletes who are in the room. And I wish you all the best. Um, and I hope that your explorations of your physical accomplishments are also matched with your explorations of your of your mental accomplishments and um, kind of your your kind of spirit of, of giving and supporting each other. Monique, I hope you're watching us. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. That was absolutely incredible. And I just sit here or stand here now and just think that this is really what it's all about. Someone who was told they couldn't do something and didn't accept it. Who was told that they weren't enough and didn't believe it. That they were going to find a way and if you're not going to let me become a doctor, then I'm going to become a politician. And I'm going to make sure that the next person that wants to become a doctor that is a woman, a woman of color, a woman of any type, that they can become a doctor. And the next woman who decides they want to practice law will be able to do that. Thank you for the labor of love and everything that you have done to bring this forth 
so that all of us can be better educated. So much gratitude. Thank you so much. So carrying on with that aloha spirit from Hawaii, Coach Carl Ferreira, if you'll come up. So, Coach Ferreira, or as I lovingly like to call him, Yoda, he, uh, he, you know, he coached the Cal State Bakersfield, he coached in the Volleyball National Championship for Division II, then he went to the University of Idaho, then, um, oh, he helped out at Stanford, then he went to the University of Oregon, and then he came to Bakersfield College. And there was a time that our offices just faced each other. And this man has saved my career more than once. And his insights are so very much appreciated. And he is a man, he's a girl dad, he coaches women, he understands the privilege that that is, and Carl, we're just glad to have you here with us. Thank you. You should actually open up with Aloha. Come on, we got to bring the Hawaii. Aloha. And I did stop to say, of course, I know Patsy May because I grew up in Hawaii, and uh, she was very, very popular in the Ferrara household. So, wonderful. Thank you very much for everything you shared. So, real quick, you know, you knew what that all about, you know? I was too young to understand it all, and I'm much more educated now about the process, but um, I honestly didn't know she was involved in the writing of the Title IX, so this is fantastic. Very, very, very cool. And, and Judy will be available for signatures. I've got to make sure I get my book and get it signed. And then um, Cheryl will be available for signatures and selfies and all of that when we get done. And, uh, I, woo -hoo! Yeah, that's right. And Alicia, she's available for signatures. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Carl, you know, you grow up in the islands, you come here, you start competing in sport. Tell us about your journey in coming into this coaching women and everything else. Yes, uh, you know, if you ask me when I was there, able to the talk 500 things I was going to be doing at my age, Coaching women's volleyball wasn't even on the radar. Um, I left Hawaii to go to Santa Rosa Junior College to play basketball. Uh, when I was at Santa Rosa Junior College, I took a PE volleyball class, just like I teach right now. And the women's volleyball coach said, hey, you, you play volleyball. I uh, grew up in Hawaii, played volleyball. And so she asked me, would you like to practice with our team? I'm 18, women are 18. I said, of course, <laughs> easy decision. Uh, so I, uh, I practiced with the team, and then she said, hey, you know, there's this new thing going on called club volleyball. Would you be interested in starting a club for us? And she explained it to me. So this is early 80s. Um, so I ended up starting a club and coaching with her. And, and then from there, it just took on a, a path that I did not carve out initially. So it just unfolded in front of me. That's awesome. So how did you make the transition from the club to college? Um, you know, initially it's just a fine path. And so I ended up working some summer camps, uh, and I went to the ones that I knew in the area. Stanford was one that was uh, very, very good. So I worked in Stanford camp, worked at ULP camp, and at the time those were two of the better programs in the country. Um, and then really from coaching club, I, uh, I was asked to be the assistant at uh, Fresno State, uh, the head coach at Fresno State, Go Bulldogs. Legend. Uh, Hall of Famer. Hall of Famer, same thing. Uh, the head coach for Fresno State was from Hawaii. Uh, her assistant at the time, Joey Brazell, played professionally with my wife in New York. So there was a double combination, so I ended up applying for the job, and that was really my first uh, collegiate introduction into beyond the junior college level. You know, and I'm glad you brought up Ellen. So his wife played professional volleyball. Legit. Legit. Yes. 
And, um, and then they had an opportunity to coach together. So share a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, um, by far my wife is the most impactful person in me understanding women's athletics. So we coached together at the, the club level, we coached together at the high school level, uh, we coached together at the college level. Uh, women need to empower women, there's no doubt. My wife is much more impactful and influential than I've ever been, and for a lot of reasons. Um, and I really want to say this before I get too much further. I think the women, senior women's administrators in the house, are the angels in my athletic career. Uh, every institution I've been in, women are always empowering women at a much more significant level than I ever would have had the opportunity. And I've seen them on a consistent basis constantly uh, moving things forward. So on behalf of all of us that don't express ourselves well enough. God bless all of you women, and uh, you're doing an incredibly phenomenal job. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you, Carl. Um, and then along those lines, you've got two sons that took the basketball road, route. Yes. Uh, I have three kids, uh, two boys and a, uh, a daughter, and the two boys came first and maybe a little bit like... Uh, your story, a little bit like Cheryl's story, um, you know, the, the boys helped my daughter. Uh, but it was my wife that made me understand, if I can just go back real quickly, you know, when we coached together, I would run a drill, and she would run a drill, and there'd be two completely different reactions to us running those drills. And it, it really, she was the one that made me understand, before there's a man and there's a woman, there's people. And they need to be treated like human beings, and you don't have to stop being demanding, you just have to truly understand how to treat them. And that, she's the one that got me on the correct path to understanding what I didn't know at the time. I think that's something that's really important. That's kind of like with my dad. Grew up in a home with six boys, had four sons, and he had me. And he started trying to talk to me like he did his sons and realized that didn't work so well. And so he kind of had to figure that out, too. So that was great that you had your wife help you out with that in the coaching room. Yeah, you know, you don't know what you don't know, and you're not going to know it until you're exposed to learning. So, um, and from there, you're obviously making some adjustments to what you do, how you do it. And then along came my daughter, and, and uh, coaching her for the length of time I did was fantastic. And, and really, I've been very fortunate because she and I have an exceptional relationship, and we never cross the lines between dad and coach. And I don't know how we did it, uh, but we have a phenomenal relationship, and, and we love the gym, but we also love dad and daughter. You know, that's amazing, because a lot of you have been coached by your parents, and kind of what was talked about earlier, that, that can not, that's sometimes not the easiest realm, and the fact that you guys figured that out is just unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a tribute to her, maybe, uh, or all of it. But I think the strength of my wife as well. My wife's a very silent, powerful woman. Um, I guess a small brag here. She's in two Hall of Fames, played professionally for three years, uh, two-time All-American. So stands very tall and is a very strong uh, woman in the, in the realm of what role models should be. So I'm always trying to empower women to empower others. And my wife did that for my daughter. Which is absolutely fantastic. And that I absolutely love. Now, I remember when um, Elise had her first club competition. And she grows up, you know, watching these University of Oregon athletes. So as soon as an athlete gets done competing all day, they take an ice bath. So share, share that story with us. This is an honest, true story. Um, I think my daughter's playing 12 and unders, okay? This is, you're just too small to be as cute as could be. So we're in the hotel, uh, and after the first day of competition, you know, dad's doing what he's gonna do, making sure she's got her, you know, food and everything. We get up to the hotel and my daughter goes, I'm gonna take an ice bath? And I said, what? She goes, don't you take an ice bath after you play? I'm like, I was just completely confused because it caught me off guard and I said, uh, okay. 
So there goes dad down to the ice machine, bringing the ice back. And my daughter just sitting at the top, just enjoying herself, taking her first high athletic ice bath at probably age 10. And I'm just on the floor with my wife. I'm going, you're not going to believe this. And we are just laughing. And my daughter just didn't know anything. This is what athletes do. So yes, she grew up in an athletic house, seeing it all happen before her. Well, and I think that that's the power of role modeling. You know, that's what she saw, that's what she knew, and that's what it's all about. You know, and, and your daughter is elite. She's at, she, she's elite, at least elite at University of Oregon. What mindset do you think helped her get there? Um, yeah, she has a great mindset. She's currently a center at the University of Oregon, entering her fifth year. She's going to be a COVID. Uh, fifth year player and uh, she's always been driven to have a work ethic to pursue what she doesn't know has yet happened um, and it's very interesting I think what can happen in coaching is after a certain level of time and maybe some of the athletes in here will begin to understand this you can get on what I would call a performance plateau a performance plateau would be where you've acquire your skill level to a certain point and then you kind of taper off and you really don't see any more improvement happening in your skill development and once you hit that plateau you're on what I would call automaticity okay so I can come to practice I can go through all the drills I can sweat and I make no improvement and you go well, I don't understand well at our age we've learned how to drive a car and I can drive the car while my body is really distracted someplace else. So your mind and body can do two different things. I can go for a run, and my mind can think of something else. So once you acquire a certain level of skill, it's very simple to automatically, robotically go through the habits of those skills. And I know I can go through a practice, but I don't improve anymore. But with my daughter, I understood a few of these things that I was just always a little bit a step ahead of her. So it was always the next boundary to explore. One, having two brothers was very good. Two, having the mindset that you've never met the best version of yourself. There's always a next step. So you're constantly pursuing how to become the best version of yourself. And you have to operate on the edge of your ability. So her mindset is very good. It's probably the best attribute I think she has as an athlete. Um, and I'm very, I'm very impressed by her, and I know I'm her dad, but just in terms of her ability to flip the switch, and as Megan would say, become an athlete, and effortlessly then become a young female. You know, one of the things that I've really enjoyed in my assistant coach, Emery, is, is when Carl's in the gym training the lease. And I always learn all sorts of stuff when you're training her. And if she's not working really hard, or just, Kind of getting frustrated, he likes to call her mid-major, which really ticks her off. And um, but you taught me a lot just in the learning phase, and that we don't learn when we're doing well. What do we learn, Coach? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously you need to stumble, fall, be uncomfortable, struggle. Um, that's really when you're going to uh, ask the most questions. So. Our job as coaches is to try to create an environment that's demanding uh, without being very demeaning. You know, create an environment of exploration where you're pursuing something you don't quite understand yet, and yet do it in a manner that's very safe. And, and it's, a, it's really a slippery slope. Um, I know for myself personally, I've had a coaching transition because the way I was raised, um, and the way I started my coaching career, right in the middle of my coaching career at the University of Oregon, I could no longer coach the way I used to coach. So now you were forced to find another way to go about doing what you did. So it's made me a better person, um, but it's all about exploration, getting, getting comfortable with failure. Uh, but you have, to, you have to create an environment where kids can fail and know that it's not really uh, detrimental. So oftentimes after practice, you know, we have these great conversations, hey, how do you struggle today? What do you fail with? And so they get very used to uh, not being comfortable. 
Um, and so it's, it's that relationship. It's your relationship with being uncomfortable uh, in order to become the best version of yourself. Yeah, that's one of the things we always talk about is I love mistakes. I love it if you're making a mistake because that means you're trying something new. If you don't ever make a mistake, you're just in your comfort zone. You're just cruising along, and that's not where we grow. So, Coach, we've got several amazing male coaches in here that have, I mean, men in here that have brought their female athletes. I know some of them personally, and, and they're just incredible men. Um, what insights do you have for them? Yeah, you know, um, I've had the chance to coach men and women, and sometimes you get asked, you know, really, what's the difference? Um, first of all, I would say there's probably way more similarities than there are differences. Um, and, and I think the differences come in the way of, uh, let me give an example. Uh, if I was in a men's locker room, and, you know, halftime, having a discussion about something happened in the first half, and I may be a little frustrated about something going on, and so I'm somewhat making a general conversation. Uh, the guy sitting in front of me is probably thinking, he's probably talking about Paula, because I'm doing my job. <laughs> and then when you talk to the women's team, they all think you're talking to them. Okay? And so they all feel, you know, wounded about the things you're saying. I think Cheryl called that leading, leading with your emotions. There we go. There we go. Um, so you really have to understand. I, I, I think you just have to understand there's, uh, A, there's some physiological differences. Um, B, there's some sensitive and emotional differences. Uh, they are phenomenal at caring about each other as teammates. Um, and so if you... It, it, in a guy's environment, you could criticize maybe a guy in the public setting in front of the team. It may not affect the teammates around them. If you do that on a women's team, you're wounding everyone around them because they care about their teammate. So let's talk about the rubber bullet theory. Yes. <laughs> um, I honestly don't know where I learned this. Uh, I'm not sure where I heard of it, but I have a theory called the rubber bullet theory, and it goes in line with what I was just saying. If on a team, if I was coaching, uh, and I said something to a player that was a little too constructive in nature, not only did I affect that player, but I wounded her and I affected the teammates surrounding her. So now instead of only one player uh, not performing, I've just ruined my own team. I have to learn these things by- But tell them about the rubber bullet and why that works. Yeah, the rubber bullet is if I use a real bullet, Obviously, you're going to get killed if you use a rubber bullet. You just get wounded, okay? so you're not going to be going away. So the rubber bullet theory is one in which you don't want to wound your own player because not only is she now affected, but I've affected the other players on the team, and there goes my practice. Coach, I've learned these things by failing. And, and you know, and that's one of the things that I really appreciate about you. You've done a lot of introspection and different things. And one thing that's awesome about Coach Ferreira, I would put him up against anybody in the country, any coach at any level, with what he's done with regard to mindset. And he's put together a book called The Untrained Mind, and he's very generous to me every year and allowing me to use that book. He's worked with some of my coaching, coaching buddies, my wolf pack. Um, so, what brought on this passion of mindset, and what what would be just briefly advice you would give to these athletes in here? Yeah, I'll, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just tell you a quick story. Um, while I'm at the University of Oregon, I had two experiences that uh, really changed my career. Number one was I was professionally coached uh, by a former NBA head coach. Um, and when I was the head coach here at Cal State Bakersfield, the men's basketball at the time, uh, named Pat Douglas, handed me a flyer and said, um, you should work with this guy. He probably knew something that I didn't see at the time. And I said, and I was too young to, to react. So I said, yes, thanks coach. And I took the flyer and I stuck it in a folder. Um, left the universe, or left Cal State Bakersfield, went to Idaho, and now I'm at the University of Oregon, and the men's basketball coach at the University of Oregon says, hey, Carl, you ought to work with this guy. And uh, he said he resurrected my career, and if it wasn't for him, I'd have been out of the profession. So um, that was Ernie Kent. 
So I'm at the University of Oregon, Ernie Kent, women's basketball, then the women's basketball coach, women's tennis coach, and the men's coach were all working with this professional coach. And he really got us to understand a different version of you. I think sometimes as a coach, the challenges are we don't have an academic credential of four years of instruction on really learning every single thing that we should learn. So you're doing it through the seasons and the evolution of getting better. So um, I worked with this professional coach, got me to understand things I didn't understand. The second thing I did was I worked with a cognitive psychologist. She had her PhD in neurology. Um, she was a former ex-gymnast, an ex-gymnastics judge. So she really understood the mind. And it was my first introduction to understanding the mind beyond sports psychology. So this was more cognitive psychology. She comes to my practice, and I'm running a drill. As soon as the drill ends, I look at her and I say, there. Can you coach that? And then we start the drill again, and the ball keeps going. And then the drill ends, and I said, there. So what I ended up figuring out from her was, when the ball is in play, they were fine. And, but there was so much stoppage in the sport of volleyball. So all the mischief in the game came after there was a result. They would have to play again. There was a result. They would have to play again. Well, I took a stopwatch, went back to my uh, video, and I watched the game of volleyball. The ball was in play for only about five to six minutes, and the ball stopped for about 15 minutes. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm only coaching five minutes of the game, and 15 minutes of it, I'm leaving it up to them to figure out how to move on to the next play. So I got to studying the mind and understanding that I had to get better. So now there's only three things you can coach. You can coach the craft, so it doesn't matter what sport you play. And I think we do an exceptional job of this. We can coach our bodies to perform the craft, which I think we have now elevated strength training and conditioning on an elite level. And now there's the mind. The mind being the most important one, and yet I didn't know a thing about what it took to coach the mind. So I came up with this term that I said that I thought our athletes were imbalanced. You were overskilled and underdeveloped. And I needed to learn what it took to give them the same amount of repetitions mentally than, as I did physically. So at the present time, coaching volleyball for me is very easy. I've coached for a long time. Running drills is very easy. The impact and the influence comes from can I get the athletes to understand themselves and understand and implement tools and techniques about their mind primarily in the flow of the action. And that's the key. And, and that's what's helped me. That's what I try to work with my athletes and with. And, um, you know, and Carl just said something, Coach Ferrer just said something that's really important. Ladies, you know who you are. Do you know who you really are? Do you know what your purpose is? And if you sit there and you're like, yeah, I don't know. Spend some time and figure it out. Find out who you are. Find out what your purpose. And if you do, when you do, great things will come to pass. Coach, what do you see as your purpose? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just purely about impacting and influencing people. Um, you know, for me, I have, a, I have a coaching philosophy, and if you don't, coaches, if you don't have your coaching philosophy written down, I would encourage you all to make sure your coaching philosophy is written down and, and explore changing your philosophy every January and, and consistently upgrade. I'm telling my players all the time, look, our phones, they upgrade themselves. We don't have to do a thing. Who's upgrading us? We have to upgrade us. So it's an honor and a privilege to participate in the growth and development of someone else's child. Okay? When I became a father, it got a lot easier to coach because now I understood the sensitivity of I'm coaching someone else's child. So it's really don't hold back on you know, the expectations of them. 
and make, but you got to make sure how to get through to them. I was sharing on my table back there, what I have to say as a coach might have a little bit of value, primarily because you've just been doing it for a while, but it is not more important than what the athlete says to themselves. Now the hardship with that comes from, I don't know what you're saying to yourself, but you're the most important person in this relationship. So I spend a lot of time getting you to understand you, as Coach Dologist, Coach Paula just said. So unless you understand yourself, unless you understand where you've come from, what's holding you back, it's gonna be just a hit and miss. I think playing sports is actually very easy. I think understanding yourself is very hard. I think taking your game to the next level is very hard. I think understanding how to show up, okay? Showing up is not the battle. The battle is can you show up, mind, body, spirit, cross over the bridge, learn how to flip the switch, learn how to have behaviors that's at a level that's going to acquire you to push yourself, fail, struggle in a safe environment. It's just that easy. Easy peasy. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. I'm retired. <laughs> you know, one of Carl's things that he stopped me, which is true. Did you know you have the worst view of you? No one can look at you worse, look at me worse than I do at myself. And until we learn to train the untrained mind, and to turn and understand that we have value and that we feed within ourselves the value that we have. That doesn't come from likes, but as soon as we can start changing that dialogue within ourselves, we can make major changes in the world. Yeah, the, uh, the five things that I primarily uh, teach in my um, The Untrained Mind book is number one, goals. You have to have some place you're going. Right? There has to be a destination. If you just use your phone as an example, we have this GPS on our phone. What do we do? We click in the uh, final destination, just hit one button, and it gives you the directions of how to get there. Okay? Well, as athletes, we have to do that for ourselves. Well, what are your goals? Okay? What are the tasks that are going to require you to get to that goals? And what are the daily okay, uh goal that I have to do to accomplish that task. So it's a, a plotting it out, that's number one. Number two, it's self-talk. The average person has over 60,000 thoughts per day, so our mind is always in conversation. So this is part of the whole athlete. I don't have as much of an impact on my athletes as the athletes have an impact on themselves. They are in conversation with themselves more than I am in conversation or their parents are in conversation with them. So the hard thing is, and, and I remember coaching and going home and I'm talking to my wife and saying, God, I just don't understand. These two young ladies, they're absolutely beautiful. They're very, very skilled. But they self-sabotage and defeat themselves to a pulp over and over and over. And you go, why are they doing this? Okay. Well, it's through the conversations that they're having with themselves. And social media hasn't helped that. Sec the third one would be visualization. So the first is goal, second is self thought third is, as late May uh, Megan said, you have to have a vision. You will never ever outperform the image you have of yourself, okay? So if I ask an athlete to describe themselves to me, they're gonna describe who they were, okay, which is the past. They're not describing who they're going to be, and yet world-class athletes and or the athletes that perform at the highest level all have a better relationship with who they're going to be, and that comes from the visualization. Uh, the fourth would be energy. It requires a massive amount of energy every single day to do the things that these athletes are doing. Uh, an airplane, 747, it takes about 30 to 40 percent of the fuel of an airplane to just get off the ground before it starts to fly. So for us, the hardest time of the whole day is getting started, every single day. So it takes a ton of energy while you have to sleep good, eat good, and stay hydrated. And really the fifth one is probably the most challenging for in-action competition, and that's what I would call the space between. 
So I've got goals, I've got self-talk, I've got visualization, I've got energy, but now the space between is can you manage yourself after every single play? I take a play, that result is done, that goes to, to the past. Well, it's fine if I'm being successful. The moment I'm not successful, do I have the tools to stop the reaction okay, to the negativity? And then I go into the spiral because the negativity bias has a much more detrimental impact than the positive. So I could positive you to death. Now, and I don't even understand if positive works, to be honest with you. Positive, 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 positive. If you say negative things to yourself, it doesn't matter what I've said to you. Subtractive, right? subtractive thoughts. So the language you say to yourself is 10 times worse than anything I'm going to say to you. So if you say negative out loud, it's 40 times worse. I, I'm not good, I'm this, that, I'm it over and over and over. So the University of Alabama football has been extremely successful. And the University of Alabama football has six performance psychologists on their staff. Number one thing they try to do with their athletes, don't say stupid things out loud. I don't want to go to practice. It's hot. I'm tired. Okay? So first and foremost, don't say stupid things out loud. Secondly, don't say stupid things to yourself. Okay? Because you're destroying your career. So obviously we have to empower them, but more than that, they have to empower themselves. Coach, you know, thank you. This is just, this is incredible. And just, you know, today we've had all sorts of things. Um, Coach Greg McCall from CSUB, he got really, really sick today, and he wasn't able to be here. But he's another great girl dad. Um, and one of the other great women's basketball players that came out of um, Bakersfield, out of Ridgeview, would be Erica McCall. And do we have that video clip that we can show real quick of, of uh, of Erica, just kind of acknowledging her dad. She's in Turkey right now. What's up, Pops? It's Bird. Just wanting to tell you how much I appreciate, how much I love you. Um, not only just as a coach and the things that you've done for me tremendously to help me get to this point where I am today, but as a dad, um, and being a girl dad, you know, and just uplifting your daughters and, and, and telling us that we get to be Whatever we want to be, we didn't have to be basketball players, although that's where our love came from, was from you. But we could have been anything who we want to be, and you would have supported it. So I love you. I know the rest of us kids love you, and we appreciate you, and we just want to celebrate you today. So, this is. And you know, Erica is one of the greats. She's got a podcast, and um, her sister also plays in the WNBA, and they're both playing in Turkey. They're really close. One's in Emory's hometown, and one's close by. And so, really, really awesome stuff. Coach, any quick last words? No, I, I think that, uh, look, first of all, this, this is incredible. Okay? Um, I, I think this generation needs to uh, separate themselves from their phones a little bit and really get more connected to where the impact and influence comes from, and that's women role models. Um, so this, this experience is fantastic, uh, but athletes absolutely do not put limitations on what you can and can't do. Uh, everything that you've already accomplished is, is now in the memory banks. You have not met the best version of yourself, so keep pursuing and don't let dream, and then after you're done with that, dream bigger. That's awesome. <laughs> Gossiping and complaining. The question was, what is the number one killer of uh, of teams, and that's gossiping and complaining, and, and it's really unfortunate. What I do with my teams, just a very quick, uh, to combat that, is my team is in conversation every single day. We meet for one hour before every single practice, and in that hour, I'm empowering their voice. I facilitate discussion, and then they all meet in pairs. Two, at a time, they go off, they meet, and they discuss. 
and we come back, what they do is they tell me what the other person said about the perfect, the thing that we're talking about. I try to speak very little other than to facilitate the discussion. And then tomorrow when we come together, you have a different teammate. Well, I do that every single day, and what ends up happening is we develop this culture where your opinion is extremely valued. Where you come from is completely different where your teammate comes from, and your insights only come from you, and so I try to get them to understand how their voice needs to be heard. Um, so when you can create an environment that is trustworthy, Okay, we're going to not be communicating behind each other's backs, but you've got to create an environment. Otherwise, what they do is they look for somebody to justify their opinion. Hey, did you know that Sandy... <laughs> and then you say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and there goes your team. Okay, so, um, good question. Thank you. So I want to commend all of you. I don't know how long it's been that you've had to sit this long with very little breaks. We didn't even give you one this afternoon. And you made it. And you made it. How many? Was that? Oh, there's cookies. In. Now, how many of you learned something? If you learned something today, raise your hand. Okay. How many of you felt motivated? change. Straight up. You are our future. You are the greatest generation of all time. You, come on, give it up. You are the greatest generation. So don't just listen. Go be great. Thank you so much. How incredible was this event?